Thanks everyone for tuning in to yet, an, to yet another episode in which I uh, do a video on issues relating to public transportation. And uh, today we're going to uh, go back to the city from which my advocacy started, which is New York City. Um, I have been doing this, I mean, I've been blogging for almost 11 years, but I've been blog commenting about this for almost 15. Uh, and the first couple years of those uh, were in New York City. I, I'm sure I visited New York City in every single year since I, between when I left the city in 2011 and when it became kind of impossible to visit in 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about the issues of regional rail and already in uh, chat, um, we're seeing a question about something called Interborough Express, which I do wanna tell people what it is, but please tune into my blog um, on uh, pedestrianobservations.com. I will write a blog post about this. Uh, in fact, it's already half written and upload tonight uh, for better two-way discussion. Um, and I say two-way because um, comments can be much longer. There's much more time for back and forth. This is more monology. Um, for people who don't know, um, so, so it says it's going to be about regional rail and Interbar Express can be regional rail or it can be subway. Um, Conceptually, it's a subway. I mean, you can use regional rail equipment, but it's entirely in the city. The frequency, it, it doesn't branch. Frequency is urban rail. Um, so for people who don't know, um, you might see on Google Earth this kind of gash in the city. Um, now, normally when you see a gash like this, it means that there's some kind of infrastructure. Now, sometimes it's even highlighted on a map as infrastructure when it's a road, right? I mean, the, I mean it's not like this is colored, uh, what color is this, orange? Gold, bird, sienna, something, right? It's not, it's not like this is has this color. It's just a color for roads, so that you can see it on a map. And if I uh, take it out on a layer, uh, and if on and if I play with the layers and don't have roads, it will look the normal color for which is gray. So when you see a gash again, it, it can be a road or it can be a railway. And in this case, it's a railway. Um, but it's on a passenger railway, so this gash is the Long Island Railroad main line. Um, let me move so that people can see, not see me occupy the screen. Uh, so this is, for example, the main line of the Long Island Railway. This is an underused Long Island Railway uh, LRR line called Montauk Line, the Lower Montauk Line. This is not a passenger rail line. This is something called the Bay Ridge Branch. Um, I do not remember when it was built, but it is sunk, and you can kind of, kind of see it. it's not, it's not the, so if you zoom in, you will see that it's a trench. Uh, and, uh, it is a very lightly used freight line. I, uh, was told by an area advocate named Uday Schultz, who generally knows these things very well, that it's two to four trains every day. Uh, and uh, there have been plans going back 25 years to use it for passenger rail. Uh, so, so the point is that it's a circumferential line and it hits a lot of the subway lines. So the subway lines in Brooklyn mostly go frop, 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 frop into Manhattan. And then there's the G, which doesn't go into Manhattan, but the G only connects like, the, near, the very inner areas of Brooklyn and then Long Island City. Um, this is farther out. It has pretty good connection, actually, to go about the lines. Uh, so uh, there, is, there have been various lines to reuse. This is either a subway line or, a, or something like the London Overground. Uh, and uh, um, so you go from Brooklyn and Queen and, and, and to Queens. Uh, the older plans would have it also going into the Bronx on this bridge, the four-track bridge. Two tracks are used by Amtrak. Two tracks by rather lightly used freight. Um, and then you go into either the, uh, there was a plan to go to Yankee Stadium. There was a more recent and inferior plan, if you ask me, to go up the Northeast Corridor. And uh, the governor's plan doesn't do that because of freight issues on the bridge and instead would just terminate here in Jackson Heights for the subway connection. Uh, this is an interview for us. It was announced a couple days ago. All of the area advocates are salivating. Um, and uh, but I'm not but, but but enough about this. This is about regional rail, um, not a subway line that might be run with regional equipment for uh, compat for technological reasons. So regional rail in New York 
usually I think when people talk about it, people talk about um, the map. So when I say map, I mean uh, the kind of so so you see so things they call concept or you know, things it's some, things like this, right? It's um, it, it's called crayon in British English and a lot, a lot of their connections. When people, the idea that it's kind of a Scottish accent of just drawing, uh, of kind of just drawing colored lines on a map in crayon. Um, and uh, so I think I did a video about this actually, and I don't want to retract it, and I, and I don't want to talk about this again. Um, so I think more important than to figure out where the tunnels are or the lines go, which is very important. The very large investment. I mean, several, I mean, I think it should be a couple of tens of billions of dollars, and I keep talking and I keep telling people about how New York should build things at probably an order of magnitude less cost than it builds things right now. Um, so this is more about this is about the systemic issues involved in setting on regional rail, and and, and as I said, it's going to be New York focused. So um, if you go and put in regionalrail.net, I keep telling people, you do this, uh, not this, not this, not this. Um, then you're going to get a redirect to the Transit Matters plan on regional rail, uh, written by a bunch of people, including myself, as I keep telling people, I'm not the lead. Um, this is what Ethan Finland is for. And, uh, it, uh, and and we're doing things, uh, and we're doing, and again, it's very Boston-focused, so for example, a lot of what we're talking about is electrification, because in Boston, no uh, no regional train in Boston is electrified. Um, so, so in Boston, uh, they have the system, which is actually at this point going to be easier for me, instead of trying to hunt down the, and, and, and I'm trying to show you guys the railroad, um, might be easier for me to just do this and show you the uh, regional rail. Uh, crayon, so the black line is a tunnel called the North-South Rail Link, which does not exist, uh, unfortunately. Um, so the colored lines are, for the most part, the lines that exist, um, with a bunch of infill stations. Um, and so on this system, the only stuff that actually has wire is from South Station to Providence, but the trains are diesel. Um, they keep running diesel locomotives, the line has been wired for 20 years. Only now, after we have yellow them transit matters, are they looking into ways of uh, running electric trains under that catenary? Um, and, but, but while they're already doing that, they're already thinking about um, tie-ins, like I think electrifying up to Stilton, um, and uh, also electrifying the Fairmount line, uh, which is very closely parallel. Uh, it, um, these are not infill stops. All of these stops exist. Um, and, uh, or rather, these are infill stops that have been built in the last 10 years for the most part to make it kind of more useful for urban travel. Um, so this is the ideal place for electrification, um, just as a reminder. Uh, one of the reasons to electrify is that electric trains, that is to say EMUs, electric multiple units, uh, have much better acceleration characteristics than diesels, which means that they are ideally suited for short hop, uh, for short hop um, urban and suburban service. So, in general, electrification programs have been uh, local commuter rail first, and only then the rest. So, in uh, um, so so the plant so because it's also close enough to the northeast corridor, they can uh, reuse the uh, substation, which I believe is in Rockbury. Uh, and, and so, the, so the history. So let me uh, finish the thought because it's actually relevant to New York as well. Um, the fact that it's most important to uh, electrify the inner lines because they make a lot of stops, and the acceleration characteristics are of course the most important when you make the most stops. If you're just treading along and it's a long range line with you know a stop every fifty kilometers or something, I mean. Acceleration gives you the, having good acceleration saves you time relative to having bad accelerations per stop. I mean, also if you have slow zones in the middle, but stops are the most important because what is a stop? A stop is a slow zone of zero. It also means that the train opens its doors for you know to let passengers in and out. And we're going to talk about this 
in a little bit as well. Um, but um, but the but the slow zone part of it is uh, why it's important to accelerate, and this is uh, and this drives everything. Subway trains, for example, are not optimized for top speed. Who cares about top speed when you're running in a constrained city and you have a stop every kilometer? No, what's important is being able to accelerate and decelerate quickly uh, because you're doing that every kilometer. And if you're saving 20 seconds per kilometer, that's an enormous saving. Uh, whereas if you're saving 20 seconds per, I don't know, 10 or 50 kilometers, who cares? Um, so historically, so again, this is, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm not telling you something that nobody else knows that's going to blow your mind or something. This is something that has been well understood within the industry. So where does electrification start? The answer is always local lines. First mainland electrification in the world was such a line. It was in Paris, actually. Uh, the, uh, uh, so, so in Paris, there are six historic terminals. You can see them. Even, you can see them as kind of gashes because there are huge rail yards attached to them. So, um, going. Uh, so, so let's go clockwise from the historic first, which is Saint Lazare. This goes roughly west and northwest. Then Gardino, which, as you might guess from the name, goes north. Gardino that's actually very close to Gardino, which you can see goes uh, and then veers east. Appropriate for the name. Uh, Gare de Lyon, you can guess what the major city is, uh, it serves as, but because of its connection to Lyon and Marseille, it's the busiest high-speed rail station in Europe, uh, whereas for commuter rail, actually, uh, Gare du Nord and Salazar are busier, uh, Gare d'Austerlitz, and Gare Montparnasse. Um, if you see other RER things, that these are things we're not. Uh, one of the main terminals. Now, the company that uh, uh, operated the trains to Austerlitz built an extension over here to Gargose, and this was electrified and this opened as the first electrified mail in the world in 1900. So the intercity trains were steam, and they would only go as far as Austerlitz, but the commuter trains, they do not know how far out they would go, but they would go up to uh, Gargose. Uh, it is now called Mizedose. The station uh, actually was closed. Uh, the station house, rather, was closed and turned into the Mizedose, a museum of uh, impressionist art. I was there shortly after I moved to the city. I highly recommend. Uh, and the but the, the trains are still there. The train tracks are still there in the in the basement. It's a tunneled station, and they've even connected this to uh, the station to uh, Invalide as part of the RERC. Regional rail. Uh, and so this is where it started in the world, in Paris. Uh, and in, I do not know if New York was the number two place in the world. If it wasn't, it was definitely one of the very earliest. Uh, in New York, it started, uh, I believe, 1903. So it might have actually, I, I'm not sure. So the subway opened 1904. Uh, and I don't remember whether uh, actually whether New York electrification on the main line opened 1903 or 1905. The, the first, uh, and, and then the L's were electrified maybe 1902 1903. So all around the same time. Um, the, and the first electrification in New York was, again, very local. Uh, why? Partly because of these benefits. Partly also because uh, steam pollution uh, is especially bad in a dense city. Why? Because... Steam pollution is terrible, uh, which is why you don't do it in, uh, when there are too many people who will breathe the fumes. So um, there had been a multi-generational fight between the railroads and the cities uh, about steam power in the cities. And, uh, and, uh, and in uh, urban extensions, often the cities required the railroads to use horsepower. Uh, this is one of the reasons Grand Central is where it is. Grand Central is... In Midtown, but Midtown is not where the original financial center of New York City was. It used to be much farther south. But um, one of the reasons that here they could get a rail yard, because it was the uh, not quite the edge of the city, but not as deeply urban as uh, farther south. And also they could run steam here, rather than uh, where it's south of the city, uh, I think they would have to use horses. Um, 
but by uh, 1900 or so, the horses are, are, are long gone. This is so they electrify what is now Metro North from Grand Central, which was already in tunnel. The uh, so steam in tunnels, especially bad. Uh, they got rid of it, and they electrified up to I think High Bridge, so about here. Um, and then soon thereafter, they extended to Wakefield, which is northern end of the city, and to. I'm forgetting when, um, when they got all the way up to Cross and Harmon, which is the end of electrification, maybe 1910. Um, th this is all electrification for the 1900s, 1910s. Uh, so this, no, this is Poughkeepsie. Cross and Harmon would be here. Uh, and, the, and, and another very early electrification, I think also 1905, was uh, um, Brooklyn to Jamaica on the LIR, Atlantic, uh, what is now Atlantic Terminal or Flatbridge Terminal, I'm forgetting. What its current name is? Oh, Liverpool Dance. Yeah, but was that mainline? I know that this was the first kind of EMU in the world, by which I mean it was not an actual EMU. So, so by the way, um, the first electric line in the uh, world that was not a streetcar was actually in London. It was the Northern Line, but that was a segregated uh, tube. Yeah, 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 I know it was an L. So it was a tube, which the, the actual tube under the Thames has been repurposed for other things. They uh, built a different one in 1900, but in South London, they're still using the old tunnel. Uh, but it used electric locomotives. So it used an electric locomotive instead of a diesel, uh, sorry, a steam locomotive. And then in uh, Liverpool, they had this L, which I don't think was mainline. I think it was an L uh, separate from the mainline, the same way as the American Ls. Um, where they had two cars, and uh, the cars were self-propelled, but each car had to have a motorman. So it was not proper EMU, where you have a bunch of self-powered cars, but um, the um, train driver from the front car can control everything. Uh, this is an invention actually from Chicago, 1897, but again, the L, not the mainline. So first mainline in the world, I believe, is Paris. Um, then you get New York, then you get London, but again, all of this is a local thing. So in London, it was, um, you know, I don't remember when the South London lines were electrified. The Houston to Watford line, so it's called the Watford DC line because it's such an old electrification. It's not the usual one used in Britain. It's 1912. Uh, Hamburg had early electrification, I believe 1907 or 1908. Um, maybe Vienna also, I don't remember. Um, so again, it's all early 20th century. And uh, in the, oh, Tokyo had a, lot of early electrification as well. And, uh, and again, it's very local, partly because of the uh, environmental damage of steam power. It is proportional to the number of people who are going to breathe the steam fumes, uh, the, the coal fumes, so mostly in the cities, but also because the, uh, but also because of the uh, matter of uh, acceleration rates. And finally, because at the time of the early electrification, not all of it, but most of it was low voltage direct current, and that requires a lot of substations. So that is more expensive when you're doing uh, long lines. Uh, so it would take later for uh, intercity lines to be electrified. And I do not know whether the first one was actually in the United States when in the Great Depression. So Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia electrified the, all the. Um, I shouldn't say all of the commuter lines because there were some tails. All of the current commuter lines in the 1980s, they cut the, what, by then, diesel lines. Um, this was, I believe, 1910s, done by both the Pennsylvania Railroad and Reading. Um, so the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, had already some electrification in the New York area. Um, very immediate, only stuff like New York can work, not, nothing very extensive, and then a lot more in the Philadelphia area, and then the Great Depression, they extended that to fall electrification from New York to Washington, D.C. Um, and that's when they also electrified um, some branches in, in New York. The, uh, not all of them, unfortunately, but uh, most of the uh, North Jersey coastline, which I believe was Pennsylvania. Um, it's, certainly, it's certainly a branch of the Northeast Carter. I don't know if it was historically run by the Pennsylvania. I think it was. Um, and uh, on, and uh, then... Uh, there were plans also to extend the New York New Haven electrification from 1915 all the way to Boston. This was only done in the 1990s by Amtrak as a preparation for the Estella. Um, in Britain, I do not remember when the main lines were electrified. I think 1970s and 80s is when they electrified the uh, 
uh, West Coast and East Coast mainline. Uh, Bernard, tell me if I'm getting the generation wrong, but I think it was 1970s and 80s, right, when they electrified these two lines. Um, and the other main lines in Britain are still not fully wired. They're right now completing the electrification of the uh, of the Britons. Yeah, no, the Southern Coast, but yes, but the Southern Coast was not a very long intercity line. Uh, oh, West Coast Main is 1968. Yeah, so that West Coast, I mean, yeah, so I, I mean, maybe because I'm thinking to them um, in a to American way in which, oh yeah, Birmingham and Manchester and Liverpool, yeah, they're different cities from London, but maybe I'm thinking of Brighton as something that's not, uh, I'm thinking of Brighton maybe as something that's kind of in the London sphere. Um, oh yeah, oh, thanks Robert. Um, so yeah, so anyway, the point is this is the history of electrification. It starts from commuter lines, then you do intercities. Uh, the Tokaido main line, I know, was electrified in 1956. Um, they run a train called Kodama, which uh, I believe run EMUs. It could do Tokyo to Osaka in six hours 50. Kodama means echo, so the idea is you can do a round trip in one day. Uh, and uh, based on the success of that train, they decided to build an even faster train with a new trunk line, or Shinkansen, and that was the bullet train. So the bullet train cut the Kodama from 650 to 4, and then the uh, and then they had to go something even faster than the Kodama called the Hikari, um, which is, uh, was 310. Since then, they've gotten faster, I think, at this point. It's 225. Um, and so, uh, but in Tokyo, again, 1950s is when they electrify the first thing that connects Tokyo to a city that you've heard of. Uh, but, uh, but the commuter lines in Tokyo had been electrified for a long time. So Tokyo was very early in electrifying the suburban, the suburban rail. And I think it was 1900s, down 20s. And, uh, and so, uh, so, so again, it's, so with steam, there was the importance of pollution, but this remains the case with diesel, less than with steam, but it's still a thing. Um, so I talked before about the Fairmount line in Boston. One of the reasons that people talk about this is that it's an urban line. Um, it's a decently dense area. I mean, Boston dense, but I mean, Boston dense is not, I mean, I, I say Boston is an area should not denigrate. I mean, I live in Berlin. I don't live in Seoul or Hong Kong. You know that I do not live in Seoul because um, I keep getting worried about catching Corona. Um, and, uh, and also uh, the StarCraft players that they uh, think in terms of are I think in terms of Clem and Raynor and not in terms of Maru. Uh, so uh, um, in, and also this is a very low income area. So uh, Dorchester, I mean, I mean, Dor I mean, the map is Dorchester. Dor Dor the, all, Dorchester is a huge neighborhood. I think all of this is Dorchester. It's the largest neighborhood of Boston. Uh, which, and it's a very working class neighborhood. I mean, people say poor. I mean, I don't like saying poor. I mean, it is a high poverty neighborhood, but I mean, most people are in Dorchester are above the poverty lines. Just the working class neighborhood, very racially diverse. Um, now, if you're European, you understand exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying ra very racially diverse. If you're American, uh, you might be worried that I'm making a euphemism, and, and I am not. The neighborhood genuinely has people of a lot of different races. I believe it's 20% white. It was historically very Irish and then historically very black, but at this point it's actually a mix of a bunch of things. So um, a lot of black people. I don't think there's a black majority, though. Uh, again, a, a sizable white minority, and it's a flat white minority. It, um, it is not the neighborhood. I don't know if it's getting whiter this year, but in the past decade, it was not getting whiter. Um, lots of Asians, actually, the Vietnamese immigrants mostly live there, which is how there's better food uh, in Dorchester than there is in, for example, Cambridge. Um, a bunch of Hispanics also. So again, it's a mixture of everything, really. Um, and again, if you're European and I say diverse neighborhood, you, this is exactly what I mean, because in Europe, Neighborhoods that are five percent white do not exist, but neighborhoods that have that are maybe let's say forty percent white, fifty percent white, and then have lots of different minority groups are pretty common. Um, so that's all. Um, and again, because the area is um, not very wealthy, 
Uh, and again, it's also sort of what's behind art, which is Mataplan. Uh, people are talking with environmental justice issues of having uh, lots of diesel trains through there. Uh, and so they're talking about making it useful as a local commuter line, at a local commuter line, and this is one of the reasons that there's an impetus right now for electrifying it. Or, let me clear. Transit Matters wants to electrify everything, but this is why people are listening to Transit Matters on electrifying this uh, more than about, let's say, electrifying the Worcester line, which is, uh, it's a long line, but it has many stops. Uh, so this is the Worcester line, and if you're thinking that I'm uh, going over the freeway, yes, I am, because the freeway was built in the right-of-way of the railroad, cutting it from four tracks to two tracks. In the process of making it so constrained that building stations here costs an enormous amount of money. Normally in Boston, an uh, infill station is $20 million. Here it's about 40. Um, and you, if you're wondering, do, do you need infill stations? Not really. I mean, maybe one, but import importantly, if you zoom in, there's only one track. I mean, there are two tracks, but there's only one track with a platform. The platform is a strip of asphalt. If you want this to be an actual station, um, you need platform here, platform here. The platforms need to be high level, and that's money. Again, normally in Boston, that money means 20, uh, but this is about uh, 40 or 45 here and then here in West Newton, and then here in Overdale. Um, it's right of way from Um And they say this, I'd have actually argued with people who are involved in that project. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is the Worcester line. It's also a line that probably should be electrified because of its short hop stations. It's a very uh, busy line. I think it's the, so it's the busiest line in Boston, the line to Providence. Second busiest, I never remember, it also depends on the year, and the count. It's either to, uh, to Worcester or the Eastern Line, which is them through Salem and then some low ridership edges here. Um, and because, but this area is middle class from the start. So Back Bay uh, is a byword for urban wealth, like the Upper West Side. Uh, Austin, Brighton, very middle class. Newton. Uh, Oh, it's a rather wealthy place. Um, I know a bunch of people who went there, and the reason I know a bunch of people who went there, uh, no, not went there, a bunch of people who grew up there, because I know them because they have gone to either Harvard undergrad uh, or Columbia grad. Um, and to make it very clear, because there are people on the internet who, because I talked so much about Harvard, think I went to Harvard and bragging. No, I did not ever go to Harvard. I went to Singapore undergrad, Columbia grad. I just um, gamed with someone uh, who went to Harvard undergrad and Columbia grad, and through that person, I know a bunch of Harvard undergrads, some of whom, not the person the, not the person who went to Columbia grad, but some of them are legacies. Um, so again, Newton is wealthy, Wellesley is very wealthy. Oh, um, Framingham, even Framingham, Framingham is, Framingham is not incredibly wealthy, but it's decently middle class. Worcester is the only place that's kind of poor, um, but, um, but it's kind of far. So unfortunately, uh, people are more reticent to electrify this. It's, uh, again, a longer line, it's more work, you need substations, you can't, uh, you, you can't tap into existing ones, but also there's no environmental justice issues, like whereas Dorchester genuinely is one of the most polluted neighborhoods in Boston. There's very high asthma rates. Uh, and part of it is because you have all these freeways that uh, bring in all the suburbanites that are driving into the city. Um, so, Electrification, again, this is, maybe you should not talk about Boston as much. So, electrification is very important. Now, um, New York, thankfully, has mostly done it. Unfortunately, mostly does not mean everything. And um, so, there's always, so everything has been, I don't want to say half measures, but maybe two-thirds measures sometimes. Um, and that's really frustrating. So, for example, yeah, the North Jersey coastline. So, um I don't have a good map of this, so I'm going to occasionally um, flicker my crayon and then have to explain to people which parts are crayon and which exist. Um, so, um, generally, if it's in the suburbs, it's not crayon. The crayon is mostly study colors. So, um, this red line, so the red slash green lines, this is the Northeast Corridor. Uh, 
And this is the Princeton shuttle, shuttle aka the Pinky. It's, it's, it's a really cool uh, system, actually, the way it worked in Princeton. Um, so the way it worked is uh, the old main line from the middle of the 19th century uh, went, I think, up to about New Brunswick, decently straight, and then went in an incredibly curvy and low-grade way through Princeton. And then they realized that you can't actually run intercity trains this way. Um, so they built as a bypass what is currently the Northeast Corridor. You can see it's a very straight line. Yeah, it's, a 90, it's an 18, either 6 or 70s bypass, um, built simultaneously with the thing that connects all of these to 33 stations in Philadelphia. So it used to be that the line would go and then dump you at, uh, you see the gap. I mean, as I said, you can see the gashes. And then dump you at a stop here um, in Huntington, which today is a very poor uh, inner city neighborhood of Philadelphia. And at the time was the edge of the city, now I mean, the city was here. Um, so instead, they built something called the Connecting Railroad with a rather sharp S curve around here. Rup, 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 rup. Another very sharp curve here. Uh, so now in uh, so um, so when they built the bypass, the bypass bypass well bypass Princeton. Um, so to serve Princeton, they built this line, um, and what they do is they run as a shuttle, where the trains are actually timed with the Northeast Corridor from New York. So um, you have so the way it works is you get a commuter train. The commuter train will make the outer stop. So there will be so not Monmouth Junction, which is a much discussed but not actually open station. Um, but it goes through New Brunswick, Jersey Avenue sometimes. Jersey Avenue is a weird stop. Um, I think the express trains don't serve that. Only the locals do, but the locals terminate there, which is rather weird. It, it's a park, essentially, Jersey Avenue is a park and ride, and we're going to get to it in a, uh, in a bit. It's a park and ride for people who don't want to drive into downtown New Brunswick. Um, so, rip. rip uh, so I guess for an express train, often it'll skip everything from New York to New Brunswick. And then start making these stops. It goes to Princeton Junction. Why is it called Princeton Junction? Well, it's the junction to Princeton. This isn't some kind of weird name. And uh, then the, there's going to be a two-car train called the Denki, where you just change its... I think it's the same platform, vaguely, if you're going outbound. So if you're going out... Um, and if you're going in, you go lip, underpass, lip. Uh, and again, it's, it's a pretty short. I'm, I'm forgetting what the transfer window is, maybe 10 minutes. Not an amazing one, but um, the trains run less than hourly um, sometimes. It seems like the hourly with some gaps or something like that. So um, um, so it's actually a decent deal. Um, and uh, so you have this. Um, Coloring this as if it's a Northeast Corridor branch, it isn't. Um, this is called the Route Transfer Line with historically a different railroad that went like this. So yes, uh, like this, I think. Central Railroad of New Jersey. And uh, um, I'm forgetting whether they actually, so it's not an electrified line. Um, this is electrified, but not all the way, and that's the frustrating part. Um, this is 1930s, as Robert says, to uh, the Amboys, then uh, to Long Branch in the 1980s, and they wanted to go all the way to Bayhead, but they didn't. And this is the really annoying part. They left this branch unwired, and it's not because it's part of a long main line. So if it's part of a long main line, so, so let's say you have a long main line, and you only electrified the inner part, and then there's been more suburbanization, so you need more service. That's understandable. No. Um, the Jersey Shore, yes, there's been, there's been subsequent development on the Jersey Shore in the last 40 years, but it's not like... But, I mean... The big wave of development on the Jersey Shore was 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and moreover, Bayhead is the end of the line. This is a branch line used exclusively for commuters, and they did not wire it all the way. This is the frustrating part. So they need to fix this by wiring it all the way. Um, and, um, and so, and this is actually very common in New York. But Philadelphia did, no, Philadelphia did the, same thing, but in Philadelphia, again, it's more understandable. It just wired a lot of things in the 1910s, and I think a little more 20s, 30s. And then, uh, and then, well, 1910s suburbanization in the United States was very limited. It did exist, by the way. 
um, often along recently wired uh, lines uh, by rich people who were wasp fleeing cities that had too many uh, uh, Jews and too many Italians uh, in them. Uh, this was even before the, 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 these people, people are so snooty. It's not, they, uh, it's not even just white people fleeing black people. It's people fleeing the wrong kind of white people. Um, and uh, so that definitely existed, but it was very limited. Uh, the, the United States um, was, uh, I mean, at the time it was majority rural, 19th and went 50-50 in the late 19th and 1920. But um, but if you lived in urban America, you were actually urban. I mean, probably not a very large city, but a place like Youngstown, yeah, absolutely urban at the time. Um, so so you lived in a place like that, and probably not in the suburbs. This developed to to a large extent. Again, there was, there was there were the early seeds of that 1910s, 20s, 30s, and then but then the big push was 50s, 60s, 70s. So one can understand why you would electrify something based on the outermost thing you think is viable in the 1910s, and then you get, and, and then suddenly you get a busy commuter line in the 1950s as people keep going farther and farther away. Um, in Philadelphia, they responded to, to this by doing the brutal thing, which a lot of advocates hate, and which I don't think was a necessarily bad decision, which is that they just cut service beyond electrification. Um, I think Newtown was the main example of this. Uh, where there was some uh, uh, electric, where there was some diesel service beyond one of the electrified and one of the SEPTA lines, and they discontinued service in the 1980s to go all electric. So SEPTA is actually the only all electric uh, commuter rail system in the, in the United States. Um, now in New York, uh, they have electrified, but they have not really done a very thorough job. So. Um, so I will point out to you which lines here are real and which aren't. Um, so this is a real line called the Port Washington line. I'm forgetting when it was electrified, but it is fully electrified. Um, these are the south side lines, uh, electrified, electrified. Uh, electrified only up to Babylon. So the, uh, this line, the line that I color orange, it's called the Hempstead branch, and it exists and is electrified. This is also a line that I have not depicted. It's called the West Hempstead line. I don't know if you can see it. It is here. Uh, yeah, you can see the station. Okay, they're flickering off, but you could see them briefly before. It's also electrified. Um, and this is a thing that used to exist, um, and they should rebuild it because the, this is so. Uh, Long Island is Long Island mostly actually because of Robert Moses. Robert Moses developed a, a system where people would drive from the suburbs to the city to, to work. So uh, for him. It was okay if there was residential sprawl, but not job sprawl. So Long Island has unusually little job sprawl uh, and is unusually economically dependent on New York City jobs. Um, and the big exception, uh, so the, the main job center within Long Island is this. So Mineola and then East Garden City. So this is a rail line that exists and has no service. You can see remnants of the line here. It's called the Central Branch. Through here, it's not as important unless you're making Levittown into something that does not look like it's the 1950s. And uh, but here it's uh, a lot of uh, uh, here it's a lot of jobs people could walk to from from these, so this should be rebuilt. Um, so this is a good example. So um, uh, and uh, this is electrified already, as I said. Um, here it's electrified. The electrified steps. So I think at one point they electrified up to Mineola. I'm forgetting when. Um, and then maybe Hicksville, and then, uh, no, 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 then they went up to Huntington, but not all the way from Huntington to uh, the end of the line, which is Port Jefferson. Uh, and this line, actually, from uh, Huntington to Port Jefferson is a very busy diesel dam. And then they went from Hicksville here, not all the way to the north fork of Long Island, which is here, which is a very lightly used diesel uh, line. There's not a lot, I mean, so far from the city, there's not a lot of suburbanization here. I mean, maybe some excursion trips, but usually the, Ham but the Hamptons are not here, the Hamptons are here. So the excursion trips to the Hamptons are here. Um, and uh, so this is electrified only up to Ronkonkoma, uh, uh, which is here. And um, 
So again, they, they set up electrification, and usually at the end of electrification, they will start to do a giant park and ride. So um, Huntington and Babylon are, are pre-existing town centers, but Ronkonkoma is essentially a giant park and ride. Um, you can see, I mean, so for example, there's an airport here, but the terminals are on the other side. They do not try to uh, integrate the airport into the station, which would be maybe rebuilding the airport so that the terminal facilities would be adjacent to the station. Um, it's just a parking lot and then a few single-family houses. Uh, and this is, depending on the year, the busiest suburban station in New York City. Uh, so the, the busiest, on, so the busiest are around Konkoma, uh, Hicksville, which is a mix of that and something that looks like development. So uh, in Hicksville, you can see the giant parking lot and the parking garages, but and, and you can see a little bit more. I mean, at least some remnants of a town center. This is a shopping mall that, in theory, people can walk to. I assure you, nobody does it. Uh, I think it's from Konkoma, Hicksville, White Plains, Princeton Junction, Metro Park. Princeton Junction is also a parking lot. Um, so White Plains is a, is a good example of something that actually has development. Um, it's a very auto-centric development, um, very auto-oriented roads, but I mean, it's, uh, but you can walk it, I've done it. I mean, White Plains, oh, in Stanford, White Plains, Stanford, same thing. Um, so these are called edge cities um, in uh, urbanist lingo. So an edge city means that you have a dense... Yeah, I know that there are plans to redevelop the airport, uh, to, to redevelop this train, um, the airport and train station. Um, my uh, complaint is not that they don't have plans, my complaint is that the plans have not actually gone anywhere. Um, is there a reason they never do parking towers? Yeah, they do parking garages. They, they do, uh, when do you, so the American default is to do, um, at grade parking because it's cheaper, but when you need more space, which you do if you're the LIRR, by the way, just to, just so you guys understand, I mean, I'm saying, oh, there are too many parking rides. Um, these parking rides are full. They have wait lists. The wait lists are measured in years. People drive, the, the, the whole way that American commuter really works, and the Long Island Railroad is one such example, People drive to a parking ride that's slightly cheaper or less full. So it's not like, so you might think, oh, right, if you live here, yeah, you uh, walk or bike or take a bus to Hicksville or to wherever. No, nobody, these people don't walk. These people sort of think that biking is a green imposition and, uh, and buses are icky things where they can see black people. Um, no, these are people who, are, who can live anywhere here and will just drive to a station with express service. Um, and, uh, and you can see this actually with, uh, um, with the stopping, pa with the ridership pattern. And again, I, I'm not going to show you the ridership pattern. The main reason I'm not going to show you the ridership pattern is that the data that I have on my computer is 15 years out of date. Uh, and, uh, I, from time I see stuff that's not 15 years out of date, but, uh, due to Patrick O'Hara, but, uh, the, um, but, but there, there are some file formats. Issues there. Essentially, Patrick Carr is the only person in the known universe who uses uh, uh, Microsoft's Live Doc editing. I think it's called One Live or something, as opposed to Google Docs, like um, the rest of the known universe. So it's sometimes hard for me to uh, access them. So I don't have it in front of me, but I can tell you verbally how it works. So you might be able to see here that there isn't a big land use difference between Hexville, Newcastle, which is, I don't think actually exists, Westbury. Carl Place. Mineola, yes. Mineola, this is a turning and job center, but very few people actually. So, uh, uh, the morning rush. So, this station is maybe the fourth busiest suburban LIR station. I believe the order is Ronkonkoma, Hicksville, Huntington, Mineola. Uh, and, uh, but this is, and, the, and this is a big job center, right? Yeah, but, um, I think 200 people use it as a um, get off in the morning. Everyone else gets on in the morning. But you can see there's a little bit more density here. But here there isn't. It's just one contiguous ball. But the ridership here and here is not very high, and the ridership here is very high. And the reason is essentially it's a kind of self perpetuating thing where you have express service here, but not here or here. So there's way better frequency. And the trains will actually get you to Manhattan faster, even though it is farther away, because here the trains will go and might actually go nonstop. And here they will make a couple extra stops. 
Um, so people will just drive through this park and ride. So this is common behavior in the region. And, uh, and this actually makes change very hard because people think about it as their park and ride or their train or their station. Even though it's not like their station in the sense that they live a kilometer or in bike to it. No, they live maybe physically closer to another station, but they drive there. And um, the uh, so a really good uh, it's a really important component of modernizing is breaking that mentality um, and replacing. So, for example, it means that you should redevelop the park and rides. Now, in some places, the park and rides are more compact. This is the case in White Plains and Stanford. And as and, and said before, there's something called Edge City. Um, an edge city is when you have a dense job center, although the density is likely to be auto-oriented, uh, in a uh, suburb where the main form of access is uh, either road or can be a railroad, but it is not supposed to be contiguous with the city center. So it does not mean that everything that is not city center is an edge city, there is spillover. So, um, the, uh, so for example, Long Island City has had a jobs boom uh, recently, uh, turning it. So, whether it has more jobs than what was traditionally the largest non-Manhattan job center in New York, which is downtown Brooklyn, uh, and the answer is that I don't know because of specific data issues in which um, I believe either old Brooklyn teachers or old New York City teachers are deemed to be working at um, the courthouse at the Brooklyn Borough Hall. Uh, so I cannot tell, uh, so excluding them, Long Island City is bigger, but there are also people who actually work at uh, Borough Hall, so I cannot tell you. Um, no, this obviously is not an edge city because this went from when, this was the downtown of the then independent city of Brooklyn, so this would be called a secondary downtown, like uh, downtown Newark is also an example. Um, so this would be a downtown, a traditional city center of a city that has been absorbed by a larger city. So Brooklyn was legally absorbed into New York. Newark was, of course, not, but Newark fell into the orbit of the New York City metropolitan area. Um, so, so we have primary city, but we have secondary downtown, like downtown Brooklyn, like downtown Newark, um, like Journal Square, which was the head start. So this is Journal Square. Sorry, this is Bergen. This is Journal Square. This is the historic downtown of Jersey City. Then you have Spillover. So we've discussed, so, so so far we've talked about two different things. Primary CBD, like Lower Manhattan or Midtown Manhattan. Uh, secondary, uh, historic secondary downtown, which would be things like Jamaica and Queens, Flushing in Queens, uh, uh, downtown Brooklyn, downtown, downtown Newark and Journal Square. Uh, now there's spillover, which is a very recent thing, which is essentially when a city center expands into a nearby area, uh, which can just be an extension of the central business district in the same way that if, say, Midtown Manhattan were to expand a little bit into the Upper East and West Side, nobody would perceive it as something very different. Um, I mean, people do psychologically perceive 59th Street as a big barrier, but they don't think of the avenues as such. So when Midtown expands East and West, people will just call it Midtown. But sometimes it hops a little bit, like if there is water, so it can hop the water from Lower Manhattan to Jersey City. So now we see that there's a lot of tall buildings here. Um, th so this used to be rail yards. These were all rail yards of uh, historic railroads that uh, terminated in Jersey on the uh, on the waterfront uh, and then had ferries that would get them to Manhattan. Uh, by the way, none of these exist. These are tunnels. Uh, Hoboken is a pre-existing station uh, that exists. So it used to be uh, exchange place for the Pennsylvania Railroad, which then built this tunnel for Penn Station in open 1910. Um, this is uh, Erie Terminal for, well, the Erie, uh, which is starkly connected to these lines. Um, this is Hoboken for Lackawanna. The Erie lines currently just go to Hoboken, so it's whip as opposed to whip. Uh, and then turns terminated Hoboken. Uh, and then there's the path train. So this is uh, a system that instead of doing this kind of regional connection, you can see the transition there. They built these trains and with two tunnels, one going rip, one going whip, to get people to uh, to the city, to New York. Um, and But so this was all industrial rail yards and then with the closure of all these stations in the post-war era, this area was redeveloped 
And uh, so it became kind of a spillover uh, region from lower proximity to lower Manhattan. It's right next to lower Manhattan. Uh, maybe not by car, because the Holland Tunnel is perpetually jammed, but certainly by rail, uh, by path. Um, so this is where you're seeing all these tall buildings. There's a lot, a lot and lots of redevelopment. Actually, Jersey City is very empty uh, in a region that very much isn't. Um, Long Island City is another such example that it was a very empty. But generally, it's, it's places that YIMBYs like because it's very urban development. Um, then there is something called an edge city, which is farther away. Um, usually comes out of um, people in the suburbs trying to get somewhere rather than, uh, and maybe not have to deal with city traffic jams, rather than uh, spill over from city centers. So that would be a place like White Plains. And you can see White Plains, you can see the big buildings. These are not, I mean, yeah, some of these are parking garages or some of them have parking in the lower levels, but these are, these are office buildings. There's jobs here. Um, I don't remember how many. I believe White Plains is, sorry, 10 years. I believe the White Plains had 55,000 jobs in the city, in the city of White Plains 10 years ago, um, which actually was number one in Westchester County, slightly ahead of Yonkers. Yonkers would be a historic secondary downtown. Um, it's called an edge city, therefore. Um, the idea is that it's often based on uh, highway connections uh, or on a high income suburbanization. So the biggest ones in the New York area uh, that are fully new are White Plains and St um, Stanford. Uh, this is where uh, the rich people live. So uh, New York has very weak directionality, by which I mean, it's not like Paris where rich people, west, south, poor people, north and east. Um, in New York, it's much more a matter of distance from city center than directionality, but to the extent there is directionality, West Rister is very wealthy and so is Fairfield County. Uh, so this, this is very rich, so a lot of CEOs moved here and they chose to move the corporate HQs to these areas so that they would have less, uh, they would have shorter drives. So uh, General Electric uh, moved headquarters from the city to Fairfield. Uh, um, IBM, not to White Plains, but to Armok, which is somewhere here, I believe. Uh, and again, a lot of companies to Stanford, White Plains, uh, Greenwich, uh, and uh, um, there's also actually a really large one uh, um, in Central Jersey, um, around New Brunswick, uh, Edison. Uh, th this is not, uh, but that, that's not recent post war. This is something that had the uh, historic downtown that kind of became an entity. This is where uh, it's called Edison because this is literally where General where Edison founded General Electric. The um, first place in America with electric lighting with I was either Edison or Woodbridge, um, and uh, this is so. This is where a lot of the labs were. Um, Silicon Valley is the most recent example, and there's something called Edge Labs. So we've done, so four things: our right? primary CBD, historic secondary downtown, spillover, Edge City. And then there's edgeless city. Edgeless city is like an edge city, but much less dense. Um, Princeton has such examples on Route One. You can see that there are buildings here and office parks, but this is not this. Different things. Edgeless cities are incredibly hard to serve by rail. Edge cities are easy. If the rail exists and if service is good and if you invest in walkability, which you can. So, I mean, yes, these are very wide roads. They're not very walkable, neither here nor in Stanford. Um, but you can see where you can make them walkable, right? I mean, it's not like these are all cloverleaf, like cloverleaf exchanges or cul-de-sac, right? This is an urban grid. This is a normal urban grid um, where, yeah, I could probably... Uh, all our single family zoning and legalize the construction of apartment buildings here so people could walk here and there would be more walkable uh, retail uh, here for, for local residents. Um, you could, and by the way, it's not entirely single family yet. Yeah, this area is low density, but I mean, there are people who live in townhouses here. Um, and, um, and you could do some road diet, you could improve bike facilities. Um, you can try to uh, invest more in density here on the other side of the station because this is very close to the station, actually. I mean, you need to somehow count this so that people can walk to the station without feeling like they're about to get run over by a car on this, but that's not that hard. Um, so this is very retrofitable. So um, 
the, and again, edgeless cities are harder. Uh, and so I'm talking about the New York examples, by the way, there are some non-New York examples. Um, okay, let me look at questions for a sec. Um, Robert, when I talk about division, I mean, I'm thinking about, um, so the red line, the one called line one, the idea is that there's this really weird thing with the thing that, uh, with the way I drew this crayon, which I am very not wedded to. The idea is that you're good, you should probably have two tunnels, the, uh, existing one and the one that's being built for gateway any decade now. Um, but you have three kinds of service to run, which is local commuter, express commuter, and intercity. And I keep telling people that I think intercity should actually be paired with the local and not with the express. And the reason is that you want the, and, and again, this is a really weird thing. It's specifically because I think there should be a stop at Burger Line Avenue. This can only go in the, um, I think, new tunnel. Or oh, when you can only build, if you can build in the old one, that's better. Um, so you want the uh, Burger Line Avenue not to be where the intercity is going. You also want the intercities not to go through Grand Central because that's going to mess up. Uh, local commuter rail um, between Grand Central and Harlem. Uh, and so, um, but on the other hand, you want the old tunnel to be for express, uh, to be for local trains for the local stations here. So it's this really weird kind of situation where there are a bunch of constraints, each of which argues in favor of a different assignment. And I am not wedded to the one that I made here. So, um, so that's the answer to why you need to do things via Grand Central again. You don't need to, it's one possibility, and I specifically don't want to discuss the grant, if that's okay. Um, and yeah, so there are things that are not new transit. Um, so actually, uh, Silicon Valley is a really good example of it. Uh, they're probably the most significant edge city in the world. Um, and often this is the scale of, so before, but before I go to Silicon Valley, I actually want to show you the kind of most famous American edge city, which is called Tyson's Corner, or just Tyson's at this point. Um, and this is actually an example of an edge city that consciously wants to, to be more uh, more walkable. So um, this is Tyson's. Um, it is the intersection of, I believe, Route 7 and 123 here. And then when the Beltway was built, um, it was it became very conveniently accessible from a bunch of places. This is, as I said, it's often a high income phenomenon, and this is the favored core. So DC, unlike New York, has very strong directionality. West is wealthy, so this is city center, it's more city center, and then Georgetown, uh, kind of famously uh, wealthy, uh, and then the suburbs in this direction uh, in Maryland are uh, wealthy as well, and uh, you hop the river, you get into rather middle class areas of Arlington, and the suburbs behind these are very wealthy. Uh, actually, the in America, I'm not sure about now, but certainly maybe 10 years ago, the richest counties by median household income were not in the New York or San Francisco regions, which are generally wealthier than the D.C. region, but actually Fairfax County, and uh, which is this one, and uh, then the county behind Fairfax. For some reason, it's joining me, not uh, the county lines, but the municipal lines, and then here it's Lowdown County. So these two counties. Uh, just a factor of how the county lines in D.C., align with uh, where the upper middle class lives better than elsewhere. Um, so this is what, so this became a, a very big job center. Um, and here you can see that the roads are not as nice for pedestrians. Just, I mean, you see more clover leaves and so on than in white lines. But they're actually trying to do a lot of sprawl repair here. So um, I never remember if the DC Metro has just been built. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I think the Silver Line just opened, right? Um, so the, silver line, so the silver line already goes here, um, and then it's supposed to go uh, on a much lower performance extension that's, I believe, going uh, to happen, I mean, already under construction, I think, going to open very soon to the airport. And uh, so here, there are a bunch of stops, and they're trying to make this more walkable, um, just because the traffic jams are horrific. There's a giant traffic jam. You'd, you'd expect the traffic jams would be morning and afternoon for rush hour. Um, but Tyson's has an innovation that, that has three traffic time periods, morning and afternoon for rush hour, but also lunchtime because it's so unwalkable. Normally, uh, you walk to lunch. I mean, you either 
have food on site, for example, if you work at Google, but Tysons doesn't do that. Tysons is not a tax center. There's actually very little tax in the DC region. I mean, more than in, probably more than in a you know, random European city, but by the standards of New York, Boston, let alone San Francisco, DC is not a tax city. Or if it is, it's maybe defense contractors, which are culturally very different. So you don't have the on-site food culture. Instead, you go get food nearby, except nearby you need to drive. So, uh, so there is, or until very recently was, uh, a rush hour period just for lunch. Um, so again, they're trying to do better. They're trying to make this, uh, the city more walkable. Um, again, it's called sprawl repair, and it is a very promising thing for auto-oriented edge cities like this. Um, and it's useful, but it's useful for them to be on a rapid transit line. Now, in the case of Tysons, there was never a historic rail line here, so they actually made sure that uh, Metro will pass through here. This is the good part of the Silver Line. Everything about, else about the Silver Line sucks, uh, and it's made the system worse because of weird branching issues that I do not want to get into. But the idea of service to Tysons is actually very good and very powerful. Um, um, other important entities, as I said, Silicon Valley. Uh, so San Jose is a historic downtown uh, that uh, still has a lot of historic downtown problems. I mean, I think downtown San Jose is like 50,000 jobs. Um, but it kind of became an edge city. Um, the area becoming just very auto-oriented. You see all these freeways. Um, and then just lots of things. There may be a left city in the sense of having unstructured office parks, but some of these office parks are so huge that they have the density of an edge city. So these would be things like the Googleplex, um, the Facebook HQ, and I'm forgetting whether Menlo Park or Palo Alto. Um, some of the older tech companies um, like Adobe or Cisco. Um, and again, these would all be um, in Silicon Valley, so between San Jose and uh, South San Francisco, I believe is where a lot of biotech is. I think it's also where Stripe moved after uh, they decided that they don't want to deal with San Francisco uh, with San Francisco uh, populism anymore. Um, and the thing is, these are not structured around Caltrain. Uh, it would be amazing if they were, because a lot of people do take Caltrain reverse peak uh, in the Bay Area, but not uh, but, but not as many as they could. It's still mostly a traditional peak, and the big obstacle... So the traditional peak has an obstacle, because Caltrain doesn't get to city center. Caltrain dumps people at a place called Fourth and Thing in a neighborhood that's called Mission Bay here. Uh, this is how the buildings look near the train station, aka what a European city would consider very tall buildings. And this is what the buildings look in actual downtown San Francisco and what an American city would consider tall buildings. Notice the difference? Yeah, there are plans to build what's called a downtown extension to do this. Unfortunately, they're being stimmied by... Uh, construction costs from hell. Um, but the line will certainly open any decade. At the other end, it's the same problem. Uh, so, for example, Palo Alto is, or when I last checked, which was a couple years ago, is the second uh, busiest stop. And I think it's this one, actually, Palo Alto. Um, yeah, because of the proximity to Stanford. But Stanford campus is not quite the front end station. Close, but not quite. Um, so maybe you would want to expand campus to work here, um, and maybe expand jobs to work here. Except that Palo Alto is one of the NBS cities in the region, which means that something like this near a train station. So these buildings probably are about, should have, I don't know, 50 floors here, here. Um, and, uh, and the... And you can think they're almost at the train station, but not quite. So, um, the, is this Calav? Oh, no, it's Stanford. It's a special Stanford club. This would be Calav. So, this is the station that I know because I went to a conference here and I uh, even uh, missed my train to the airport because I had to sell maybe 80 bucks or 100 bucks for a taxi, which Richard and I offered very generously to, find, um, to to pay me back for because I uh, uh, got confused by a certain underpass here. There's, so um, at the station, most of the development is on that side. So um, there, so if you want to go inbound, there's a 
an underpass, but there are actually two underpasses, one of which gets you to this platform, one of which gets you to the park. And it's very confusing, and I got to the wrong underpass. Uh, Richard Mlinarek has been yelling at Caltrain about fixing the wayfinding issues here, I think, going back to the 90s. Um, so anyway, it means maybe more development. You can see development, it's not nothing. In terms of development, most of it is kind of far away. So um, a lot of the behavior would be people maybe biking on these roads. So you live in San Francisco, you go home, and you bike. Because you have to. I mean, this is not walking distance. Um, or the Googleplex. So go, I mean, so there's Mountain View. Now, Google probably... Uh, sorry, Mountain View. I'm pretty sure that if Google had free reigns, the, uh, there would be right at this area... A 100 story building for Google. They're trying to do that in San Jose. San Jose is EMBR than Mountain View, Mountain View is EMBR than Palo Alto, but even Mountain View does not let them expand the Google. So a lot of the jobs are here. Not just, uh, so, so these are things that you, look, you, you see the you see 101 here. I mean, all of it is star freeways. Um, now, this exists in Europe as well. Um, often these are things that are more uh, more um, rail oriented, like Schista in Stockholm. Um, often coming from uh, European hostility to uh, old buildings in city centers. Sometimes it's spillover, like La Défense, like uh, um, like Canary Wharf. But in New York, thankfully, uh, these periods have edge cities. Yes. Uh, so in Paris. Uh, I don't know if Paris has edgeless cities because Paris has because edgeless cities usually happen without any planning, whereas uh, or with not a lot of centralized planning. And edge cities generally happen with central planning that promote car use um, or dispersal. Um, Paris has this. So Paris, so there's the city center, and this is a primary CBD. And let's not get snobbish. Yes, our uh, Paris is very short. Uh, but there are so many, but, but there's such a lar geographically large downtown that the proportion of jobs that are within the city is actually very large. I think it's 33%. And if you, and if you add an amoeba to get to La Defense, I think you get to 37% maybe. So that beats, I believe, every American city, even New York. Um, and uh, so there would be a primary downtown. This would be spillover. Um, there are farther away edge cities that were purposely created to uh, disperse jobs. There's this, in, there's this really banned mentality, which I associate with Europe, but to some extent it also exists in Japan uh, and in the United States from a different perspective that aims to specifically consciously disperse jobs away from city center, believing that it's somehow socially unjust to have jobs in city center that people could commute to from wherever they want. Instead, they try to Keep the jobs far away, and then they get, and then they act surprised when the highest end jobs are near the highest end suburbs. As I said before, Paris is directionality. Rich, rich, poor. Some people think there's, uh, some people think that this area is scary. Uh, I recommend to all such people to uh, walk on these streets with, um, like, uh, their phone out. Uh, at uh, 11 at night. Um, and so some of these are historic city. So some of these are, would also be historic at like I think uh, Saint-Denis, that's such a place. Um, but, um, there's, but, but, but there are edge cities that were created to disperse jobs out of this misguided belief that it is a good thing. Uh, so uh, for example, Sergi is such a place. So, Sergi, so this is actually a purpose-built edge city. Uh, or uh, uh, Evry for the south. This, I, I think all of these are um, also the. Uh, I think all of these are the prefectures. So that's the uh, department capital, I guess, the department seat. Um, so this area, like Evry, or, or this is for Estonne. Uh, and then uh, Marne Vallée, which was built um, contemporaneously with uh, Disney. Uh, with your Disney. So this is a purpose-built edge city. Um, now, uh, and then you have, again, the historic downtowns like Mo and Menon. Uh, and now, in Europe, unlike in the United States, it's built around both road and rail. 
So uh, the RER was in all cases expanded to these places with new branches. So there's actually a Greenfield branch of the RERA, uh, which is actually the busiest RER branch uh, that goes. So um, so they started building it in the 70s so to Z, then to Tulsi, and then all the way to Manavale, to to Manavale Chessy, to to Euro Disney, and all of these are all of these have jobs. All, all of these are places with um, uh, in with, with various industrial jobs. Um, and likewise, Selji has a uh, greenfield commuter line uh, that was then turned over also to the RERA. Uh, if V has, uh, I never remember if it's RERC or D. Um, I think C. Uh, and if it makes me sound like a noob, well, nobody in Paris likes the C or D either. Um, so, uh, so often, so often they're near a rail line, or if there are, or if they aren't, one is built to to serve them. So this does exist in Paris, actually. Uh, but so the issue is to maybe turn the New York edge cities into more Parisian edges. So we're talking right now about development. This is a really important component, which is never on the crayon, which is sad because it should be. Or your D is deadly. Uh, were these post-war new towns, like in Britain, there uh, there are um, post-war new towns. Sometimes they have an old core, like I think Ifri has an old core, but essentially it's uh, post-war. In some way that I mean, Milton Keynes, right, in Britain, uh, Milton Keynes is a, so for people who are not British, Milton Keynes is, I think, the largest of the planned new towns of post-war Britain. Uh, and uh, this does actually have a core that is slightly older, but not pre-war, rather during war. So, um, if you know anything about the history of World War II, you've heard of Bletchley Park, where the Enigma was cracked, where the code, where the uh, mathematicians who broke the Enigma worked. Uh, there's a reason Bletchley is right here, and the reason is that it is the intersection point between the West Coast Main Line and I forget whether what the line was current was then called. I think right now they're trying to re revive it as East West. The line between Oxford and Cambridge. So it was specifically a place built midway between Oxford and Cambridge, which is where if you are a British intellectual, it was very likely that you were going for 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 longest while these were the only universities in England. Um and and so in uh in, in World War Two, um the math the math the, 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 the mathematicians they were recruiting were largely from Oxford. So yeah, you put them in the middle and you also put them on a rail line to London and Birmingham and so on. So that is Bletchley. Um, and then on that core, I think they built uh, Milton Keynes as a line that, as a city that, again, is not purely on a motorway. I mean, yes, there's the motorway, but also the rail line to London. Um, and, uh, and so in, uh, in, and so in, uh, in the United States, there has not been much planning of these rela uh, related to rail. It was not uh, highway and also rail urbanism. It was pure highway urbanism. But in some cases, this was adjacent to a railroad, for example, because there was a pre-existing suburban settlement that had formed based on rail access to the city, far away um, where you could live far away from where all these uh, weird... Uh, where all those weird Hebrews and papists uh, were living. Um, and uh, it was always nearby, but not quite the same. So the wealthiest residential places were and remained Darien and Canaan. Uh, but the job center, the, the nearby job center was Stanford and is Jam um, Stanford. Uh, and you can kind of see just by uh, level of one that Darien does not really have what Stanford has. So the if you're in a place like Stanford, so, so part of regional rail means that you should be able to get people to take the train, not just to city center jobs, but also for other things. Now, this is often a matter of service. So this is high frequency all day, but the high frequency all day should also be in support of certain things. And one of the things that is necessary is to improve the development in areas that are not just city center. So this means making Stanford easier to use as a job center, um, be real. Um, now, there are plans for this, and there are also plans to build more residential stuff here so that people could 
yeah, take the train to Manhattan. But if you live right next to the train station, you don't need to drive to a parking garage. You can just walk. Um, people aren't thinking in terms of bike access, and they will get into bike access in a moment. Um, so if you can walk, maybe you don't have a car, or maybe you do have a car because um, if you can afford a new building in Stanford, you're rich. Um, but maybe you're going to be a double income couple with just one car. Um, so maybe you're still going to walk to things that are not just um, the train station for a job. So maybe there's going to be amenities for you. So maybe retail. Now, unfortunately, retail in the United States is very classed. Um, so the so in Germany, uh, my income is top few percentiles, but I don't know what percentiles because it's not very well advertised in Germany. Um, and where do I do my shopping? Sometimes... Um, if I'm feeling lazy, I do it at a grocery store, but most likely I do it at a supermarket like Aldi, Lidl, Edeka, or Rewe. Or sometimes, uh, or sometimes Kaufland, but I don't live near Kaufland. Uh, where do people whose income is, whose income, uh, I, I don't think net income one-tenth of mine exists, but gross income one-tenth of mine probably exists. How do people whose gross income is one-tenth of mine do their shopping? At Aldi and Lidl and Kaufland. Probably they think that Lidl and Edeka are too expensive, but uh, they go to Penny's, for example, as do I. In the United States, that's not exist. In the United States, um, if they were living in New York, I mean, I did live in New York. Um, uh, they don't have Walmart. I mean, they, I mean, if they don't have Walmart in New York, they have one Aldi and three Lidl's. Um, the, it, it's very class segregated, so the supermarkets in middle-class neighborhoods are just never going to be that cheap. Honestly, even the, in New York specifically, even in working-class neighborhoods, the supermarkets are overpriced, but less than in middle-class areas. Um, so it's different chains. And this is, I don't know what, what can be done to fix this, to make America more like France, where everyone goes to Carrefour and everyone goes to Monopoly, or like Germany, where everyone goes to Aldi and Lidl. Um, but this is would be just useful. But the point is that more stuff gets developed for, resi for, for residents, if that gets built. And actually, Metro North, we're trying to use this So um, in both New York and Connecticut, I think also in Jersey, I know also in Massachusetts, the state railroads also ha already have preemption powers, which means that if I'm Metro North or CP dot, I don't need to care what people in Stanford think about my redevelopment plans on land that I own. Um, and they tried to do a high-rise project here over NIMBY objections. It did not work. It, it, it ended up not being built, but not because of the NIMBY objections. I think they just couldn't get financing because of some market timing issue. Um, but it's something. But it was a near miss, and they keep doing it and do it very aggressively. Uh, so you want a lot of DOD, residential and commercial. You want a lot of sprawl repair. Uh, eventually, you will need to probably... I want to say remove I-95, but that might be too much of an imposition, but cap I-95 here so that it's not as uh, terrible to, to cross. Um, you will want more, uh, and you will want more bikeability. And this is something that the United States, is there any wealthier than Greenwich? Yes. The two wealthiest townships in Connecticut are Darien and New Canaan. Actually, New Canaan might be wealthier than Darien. Um, I think Greenwich is number three or number four. List of... And if I'm, what I've just said is wrong, then it was true five years ago. Yeah, Greenwich is number three. So this is by per capita income, um, not uh, median, not household income, because you can kind of see it's uh, Greenwich maybe has smaller households or something. Uh, you see how you see. Uh, actually, maybe not. I mean, it's a one to. Th it's a slightly less than one to three ratio here. Maybe it's one. It's not a big difference. Maybe it's just lowering. I don't know. Um, but um, per capita income goes New Canaan, Darien, Greenwich. Wait, wait. This is not number three. Westport, then West. Okay, I have no idea why the ranking looks like this. New Canaan, Dar and Darien, Westport, Weston, and only then Greenwich. Greenwich, you see it's so poor, it's number five in Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut was for the longest time the wealthiest state in America. I think it no longer is. Like Most of Connecticut is in relative decline because rich people have discovered cities, and Connecticut has New Haven, but 
not really. Um, and so I think at this point, the wealthiest might be Jersey, maybe Massachusetts. I mean, either way, Connecticut would be top five. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, um, so at any rate, no, Greenwich is not number one. But it's close. Um, and uh, so you want more TOD. And you want more bikeability. And this is something that is much more developed in Northern Europe than in the United States. It's very normal to, um, to, to bike to the station. Um, and this is something that requires more bikeable roads. This requires more bikeability in the suburbs, which is really hard. And the reason it's really hard, it's political. Um, there's the, the sort of people who find trains okay um, might still retro, might still retro from buses and bikes, from buses because they identify them with poor people, from bikes because they identify them with hippies. And uh, and uh, a lot of that is that um, the it's, it's not about the state income tax in Connecticut. It's that Connecticut was just a it happened to be the um, favorite county. It was just the favorite. It's just the favorite county, uh, the favorite quarter of New York City. Um, I mean, so is Westchester. So like Westchester is nine hundred, maybe a million people in a state with nineteen million, and Fairfield County is nine hundred thousand in a state that they think has three point something million people, maybe four million people. Um, and so I'm in. Uh, oh right, Tsukuba and Tokyo. Yeah, that's all. I mean, Tokyo have everything in terms of development stuff. Um, and so the capability is a lot of there's this mentality that yeah, you can do regional plans around rail, maybe possibly buses, definitely highways. But bikes are viewed as a more local issue. So for example, in Berlin, there's this problem where um, the, so the city of Berlin has twelve. Uh, Boroughs, uh, and uh, they correspond to neighborhoods, or rather, or maybe clumps of neighborhoods. For example, but uh, Friedrichstein, which is this, and Kreuzberg, which is this, are one. They, they made them into one Bezirk. Um, but they don't. And, I mean, they, I mean, people can identify what they live in, but I don't think it's a very important notion of identity, much more important is east versus west, inside the ring versus outside the ring. Um, uh, I mean, and it says, yeah, I mean, and, and I keep going, people, I live near the tri point between Kreuzberg, so the tri point between Kreuzberg, Friedersheim, and uh, Mitte is right here. I live walking distance to this tri point. I cross this tri point all the time to do shopping at the supermarkets at Ostbahnhof, which are open um, on Sundays because because the train stations, you're allowed to open things on Sundays in Germany. Um, so uh, it, it's this weird thing where if a Bezirk will have a, has a green government, then there will be more bike lanes, usually pop-up bike lanes because they're cheaper. Um, and then if it and then these pop-up bike lanes randomly disappear often at Bezirk boundaries because maybe the other Bezirk has not figured this out yet. And it's, but it doesn't really correspond to how people travel because, yes, I mean, you can see where the wall was. Um, Friedrichstein and Mitte were historically east, Kreuzberg was historically west. If I cross the historic wall, I will see this because maybe I will see a monument about this, but it doesn't, it, but at this point, it's not important. I mean, it's not terribly important. I mean, yes, there's an East versus West um, Berlin identity, but it's West East, not at the wall where um, inhabitants on both sides of immediately the wall will be probably people who did not even who, who do not even live in Berlin, uh, or whose ancestors did not live in Berlin uh, until very recently, and so. Um, the and the jobs don't really care about this distinction. I mean, the jobs are spilling over from it into Friedrichstein and Kreuzberg and Gesundheit. Um, and so the boroughs don't matter very much um, in terms of I think people's identity, but they do matter politically. And this does lead to um, problems with our bike lane network. Uh, that uh, for because for example, for me the. Uh, so my mental model of the city is roughly within the ring um, and from U from U six west uh, from U six east, so roughly from here. This is about U six roughly, um, and then and I'm not the only one. It's, it, it's a pretty common mental model for people who have uh, for, for middle class people who moved to the city recently. 
and uh, because usually the West was more is more established middle class, so it, uh, so, so it's more so it's more expensive, or was historically more expensive. Um, and outside the ring, it's just far, and all of us have the income to live here, or maybe just outside the ring. We don't need to go into uh, Mount Sam or Kipenik. Uh and uh, and so. Uh, the, so, so the issue is that, yeah, the neighborhood that the people that I know live in, I mean, I, again, I live in Meta, and I know, and I have a good friend in Philip I have some friends in Prenzlauerberg, Kreuzberg, I used to live in Neukölln, I know people used to live in Neukölln, Gesundbrunnen, uh, Wedding, so, so, uh, so these are parts of, some point Wedding straddle the ring, but, um, uh, so maybe it's technically outside the ring, but the station you will use might be a ring station. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I know one person lives outside the ring in Lichtenberg, but it's Lichtenberg again, and their home stop, I believe, is actually Ostmannhof. Not Ostmann, sorry, uh, Ostkreuz. Uh, so this is, like, my mental model of the city. And, uh, and, and, and so, uh, this, and, and this doesn't really correspond to bar, to, to, to boundaries because, I mean, yeah, all of this is technically in Meta because Meta, Sunpon and Vading are legally Meta and because and Kreuzberg and Fergusen are legally Kreuzberg and uh, But Neukölln is legally only half of my car, uh, of the Neukölln Bezirk. Um, Schoenberg and Tempelhof are something different. Prenzlauerberg is legally part of Banku. Uh, so uh, so the bike, so the stuff that's local doesn't work very well because essentially the the city are drawn maybe too small relative to how people actually use the city, and uh, so, so this is a, this is a genuine problem with bike lane networks, and this is intensified in the New York area where you have two additional problems. The first problem is uh, you have much more fractionalization. So Berlin is a city of 3.7 million, and we have 12 bicycle. New York City, the city is 8.8 .8 million, and it, uh, and on land use control, the districts are essentially city council districts, sometimes uh, community boards. There's a tradition of member deference, because in Berlin, we have political parties, right? We have SPD for uh, people who are mildly racist and don't mind the, uh, that the mayor is a plagiarist who had to resign in disgrace from the federal government. Uh, there are the green... There's the Green Party in, in Berlin for people who are incredibly nimby and think that uh, build, the new buildings here are going to destroy the city and uh, turn it into a, a playground of the rich and uh, and and make it uh, gentrified to death. As I know, the Green Party is mostly the party of gentrifiers. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you have Die Linke if you have all these problems of the Greens and also think that Putin is good. Um, you have said if you think that uh, allow, uh, allowing gay uh, people into schools and teaching children about uh, gay rights is a dangerous social experiment that must be stopped. You have FDP if you think that uh, cars are good and Uber is good and the city should uh, act more like a disruptive tech firm of the Bitcoin slash NFT style. And uh, if you um, and then finally, if you believe that. Uh, um, Hitler, uh, the, the only wrong thing that Hitler did was failing to kill enough Jews, then you have IFD. So uh, with uh, this uh, amazing choice of parties, you can just choose who you're going to vote for. And uh, parties tend to govern as relatively coherent things. And the way it currently works is that we're taking the join of the worst problems of SPD and the worst problems of the Greens. And, um, and, and this is how normal cities work. Unfortunately, in the United States, we only have two parties, um, and the and there's more geographic polarization than, in, for example, Canada or Britain. In Britain, just as a reminder, uh, the, so the current mayor of London, Sadi Khan, is uh, moderate Labour, but uh, before but but the previous guy before Sadi Khan was one Boris Johnson. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Some areas only have one party. And uh, now this does sometimes exist in Germany because Bavaria is constantly run by CSU and run exactly as well as you'd expect of a single party state. Um, and Berlin is kind of drifting to that because Espada, because the Greens were the only real challenge to Espada and they failed despite the fact that 
that's where they had an unusually weak candidate um, this election. And uh, um, so generally you have bad governance and, and specifically, but, but when it's not even a consistent coalition as in Berlin, but just a single party rule where it's not even a single party that keeps winning 55% of the vote or something like in, uh, like in some uh, red states in the United States or some uh, purple states, maybe they, uh, maybe the Republicans won the 2010 elections and then they uh, decided to make sure they would be a permanent majority no matter what people voted for, like Wisconsin. Um, so they govern as the Republican Party. They gerrymander based on being the Republican Party. They're constantly worried about what if the Democrats manage to break through. Um, and again, it's terrible governance because they are not subject to regular elections because they always win. Um, but it's terrible governance and party and party cohesion. So usually it means stuff like they keep cutting taxes and cutting government services on people who have said something they don't like. Uh, and, um, and and this is not how New York City works. New York City is not 55% Democrats who are gerrymandering New York City. I mean, the mural elections are... They, every time they try to bring some very moderate person who, like, is plugged into city governance and uh, is supposed to be this time as different uh, as a Republican, like Joe Lotta or something, and every time the Democrats went 3 to 1. Um, so the... Uh, um, and so the... Uh, and, and so because of this complete lack of party distinction, I mean, the New York City Council has 51 seats. I forget whether 48 are Democrats or 49 at this point. I think it's 48. So there's this tradition called member deference where um, you don't have parties. You don't have any factionalization. Like in San Francisco, you have moderates and progressives, in, at least in theory. In, in practice, most of, the, most of the board of supervisors in San Francisco is progs. And then all the citywide elections keep getting won by the mod. So the mayor is a mod, uh, previous mayor, uh, um, Ed Lee was also a mod, uh, the state senator, uh, Scott Wiener, uh, is a mod, and it's not just the, oh, people are progging local things and mod and state things now. I mean, the uh, most recent prog primary challenge by Jackie Felder was about, uh, was specifically about the impact on local things, about the um, aggressive Yambiasm that Wiener was pushing, um, and the mods wanted to marry. Uh, and so, but but that's a weird thing about San Francisco. In New York, you don't even have mods in problems. In New York, everyone keeps using this progressive rhetoric, except for a handful of people in very specific neighborhoods that have this kind of a oh, working class outer borough identity, as opposed to let's say Bud State, which is somehow not working class outer borough, aka it's black. Um, so, so let's say people with, again, with this kind of cop identity or maybe orthodox Jewish identity, maybe use more right-wing rhetoric, but usually everyone keeps using this very left-wing rhetoric. Uh, um, one of the random corrupt politicians, uh, I think it was actually the member of Congress, that's by that, was endorsing Eric Adams for mayor and uh, said that he's more left-wing than AOC. And he said, and I say this having read both volumes of Marx's Das Kapital, there are three volumes of of capital, not two. Uh, so, so again, everyone tries to like out progressive each other in rhetoric, but but they don't. But essentially, it's this kind of I, I don't know. It's not quite consensus government because they're very like in public, they're very combative. But um, but but there's this there's no difference in uh in terms of ideology at all, um, nor in terms of uh class or, or racial interests. So it's essentially run on the basis of member deference. Chicago is the same thing. Aldermanic privilege is what it's called in Chicago. Uh, in New York, I think they, uh, I, I think it, the term originates in Chicago, but the tradition, maybe it's all in New York, I'm not sure. So it is it on local matters, which includes zoning. They defer to the member, which essentially means that they have 51 petty dictators. Um, again, maybe 48, because I don't know if Republicans get the privilege. In Chicago, the one Republican or something like that on the, uh, on city council specifically tried to get member deference and they told him to get stuff because the Republican is, I believe, what recently happened. Um, yeah, Northern English cities exact, had labor machines like this and Liverpool had, uh, was it Liverpool, I think? Liverpool was the one that was run by militant tendency, right? And they, and, and they ran it so poorly that the National Party had to step in and essentially overthrow them and replace them by mildly more competent people. And as a result, there are people, and as a result, there are people who think that Neil Kinnock, of all people, is a neoliberal sellout. Not even Tony Blair, Neil Kinnock. Uh, 
And so, yes, this was this happened in specific places. Um, it usually does not happen in a primate city. Um, so Stockholm, for example, actually has a uh, left versus right, uh, all left versus right um, competition. Uh, Paris does. Paris the uh, Paris keeps getting won by PS, but the elections are never that uh, um, lopsided. Um, I mean, Paris is very anti-extreme, right? In 2017, it was Macron's strongest department. It voted for him 89-11. Uh, and yes, the, the election was also lopsided. He won, I think, 66-34, but in Paris, 89-11. Uh, but um, before that, when it was more normal, left versus right, um, I think in 2012, in an election that Hollande won, I think, maybe 51-49 or something like that, I think the city won 50 347 or 5446, so more left wing than the, than the rest of France, but by a very small margin. Uh, and this is, I think, also the pre Brexit situation. London is drifting left essentially because uh, it turns out that having Pretty Patel and uh, what's the, the guy's name, Rishi Sonak, I think, um, in your government is not actually going to make VMEs vote for you um, when your policy is to uh, catch immigrants with nuts. Uh, and, uh, the, and, and like the only reason, and, and, and like the only place I think in London that has not completely deserted the conservatives is the Jewish neighborhoods, which uh, objected to Corbyn. I have no idea if they're going to vote Keith um, uh, in whenever the election is. We will see. Um, but um, but in the United States, has always been much more lopsided. So we have this member deference. Um, and this member difference, yeah, I mean, someone who only exists in local politics probably probably does not have the temperament to ever make it beyond that. So yeah, they're going to become a petty dictator. Um, so they're going to listen to people with very local, and it's, it's, as I just said, there's no, I mean, yeah, there are the Bezirk boundaries in Berlin, and you can kind of identify what Bezirk you're presently in, but it's not that big of a difference. Like, I mean, you can, yeah, I can do a tour for you of like the area I live in and show you this is quite like this is photo sign and this is meta, but the difference between these areas is just very small. I mean, there's, yes, you see the you see a uh, path of uh, cobblestone on the ground uh, cutting across the street network that delineates where the wall had been, uh, and uh, and you cross it and the buildings look the same on both sides. The retail looks the same on both sides. People go shopping from one side to another. This is not where, like, Mitte is not where East versus West is an important identity. And so the, um, and, and so for normal people who have maybe not moved, who maybe have moved to the city, in my case it was three years ago, but I mean, for most people, maybe I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, maybe it's not terribly important. But for people who, like, I don't know, are third generation or something, and maybe they uh, are, and maybe they work locally, which is just as a matter in New York. Yeah, this. So I did a thing, and I can, I can even show the cell file, actually. I don't need to show the blog post. Um, in New York City, this is... Uh, um, yes, as you can see, I, I told you I'm going to write a blog post about Interboro. This is where I'm doing World War, where I'm rewriting World War Three. White neighborhood. That is the name of the farm. Um, so, the community boards of New York, which are not the same as the city council district. Uh, this is a list. Of, this is something I got from on the map of how many employed residents there are per community board, and how many of them work within the same uh, within the same community board. And the only one where it's at all significant is Midtown, because why would you ever live in Midtown and pay Midtown rent in a neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of consumption amenities unless you can walk to work? And yeah, also maybe a few other places in Manhattan, like uh, Lower Manhattan, same thing. Um, I believe Brooklyn 12 is the uh, is Borough Park, so that's the enclave. Um, Staten Island is a little bit of its own thing, which means 12% work in neighborhood, and maybe in borough it's 25%. Um, so yeah, you might notice that that in the outer boroughs of New York City, uh, 
you will need to squint your eyes to find a single neighborhood where most workers work in bar. And that's bars which are very strong identity on like community boards. Um, Brooklyn 7 and Brooklyn 12. The only one. Um, so work, normal working people work citywide. Small business people work locally. So, the, so you're getting this kind of very specific um, representation of a very specific class that drives much more than other people. And uh, has a very local identity, and these people think that bikes are for hippies because they're very conservative. I mean, maybe they think of themselves as very left-wing, but temperamentally, they're very conservative. Um, and so uh, this is where you're getting a lot of... So even though, so even though green parties tend to be nimbier and more localist, um, when you have actually more localism, you don't necessarily... And you're not necessarily going to get very good bike lanes when you have things at the neighborhood scale or at the scale of a very small suburb. I mean, these are tiny suburbs in New York. They just have, not have large suburbs. I mean, I think there's the township. So the township of Hempstead is a lot of these suburbs, but um, the governance is not at that level. The governance is much more fractured. These little, I think they're called the villages. Um, and you can't ever merge them because of very strong local identities for the people who matter in local politics, who by definition of local identities, and maybe the sort of person who just works in Manhattan doesn't care, but also works in Manhattan and is not going to show up to a community meeting at 3 p.m. on a weekday. And um, and any kind of merger that is across class lines or across race lines will lead to a lot of demagogy about um, the evil of school integration. Um, so this is where it's going to be hard, I think, politically to do the uh, do the bike lanes. Now, it's also an anti-POD coalition. But remember, New York has, uh, New York, New York has state preemption um, that is already established, not just for empire state development, for which it is literally their uh, mission to, re to redevelop the state. So if they buy something, they can just build it wherever. Um, but also state agencies like the MTA can do it as a POD thing. And that means, for example, taking their parking lots and redeveloping them. Um, this is really important, as I said, for both jobs and for uh, residential development. Uh, New York builds very little. The New York side suburbs build usually little. We're talking one, maybe within a building with two units per thousand people here. Berlin builds five, and Berlin is rather nifty. EMB places, I mean, ten. Istanbul, I think, averages a lot of Seoul, the city maybe builds a little less than the suburb, but the suburbs build on top of train stations. Seoul region is ten point something per thousand people. And as a result, Seoul and Tokyo have both overtaken Paris, and I think also London, in residential space per capita, which means that outside Hong Kong, which is its own special thing, so let's call it the democrat, in the democratic first world at this point, Paris, I think, is the capital of residential overcrowding and not Seoul or Tokyo. Um, so it's, and bear in mind, Paris is the European center of the NBA. I mean, Ile de France, I mean, not the city, but Ile de France built, I think, seven per thousand people. Um, so you need to build very aggressively, and part of it is to create affordable housing um, by creating more supply, but also you want it to be structured near the train station. Ideally, you also want there to be bike lanes that people can bike at a longer range, maybe a kilometer or two or three, as opposed to this behavior where people drive down kilometers to a cheaper park and ride um, and, uh, and uh, an express station with more trains. So you want to not do that. So you want to have a time. So, so, so let's talk about what needs to change. So first of all, TOD, really important. Second of all, I talked before about electrification. So you want to complete electrification. Ideally, in a place like New York, you should not run on electrified trains. So what this means is if you can electrify, let's say, to Port Jefferson, you should electrify. Um, I think this is also the case for the trains to the Hamptons, which people are going to try to claim is cost ineffective. No, it's actually very cost effective. The IR because it's mostly electrified and the tails have very little ridership, with the exception of Port Jefferson. Um, the, uh, the, the result is that the incremental cost of the diesel is incredibly high because you need to have a dedicated crew, dedicated maintenance. Um, and so these need to be electrified, and if they don't, you maybe do a forced transfer, I think from Hong Kong to Greenport, or you just electrify, and yes, it's money, but whatever. I mean, it's not a lot of money to, to electrify from Hong Kong to... What's the example that I do? Is okay, so here... Let me just try to compute the distance from Hong Kong to that. It's going to be a long line because it's 
because I'm assuming it's still running. So, um, so let's start to look from Aconcoma, which is here, kilometer point 183, and the line goes up until, until 256. So yeah, 73 kilometers. Um, no, I mean, I mean, you might need more substations because it's a third rail. Um, but it's going to be very light substations because there's not a lot of traffic. Um, it's mostly single track. I mean, I don't know what the third rail cost is because it's not very common, but the catenary cost of this is $100 million, maybe $150. Um, again, Port Jeff's going to be, Port Jeff is a longer line. It's gonna, uh, I mean, not a longer line, it's a shorter line, but it's a higher traffic line. Um, you would need to do some, uh, no, I don't want to cut. Um, and it has more traffic, so Huntington is here. So, kilometer point 15, and this is, okay, 37. Yeah, this may be another... Hundred. I mean, it's not that. I mean, and this is with, and this is if this is mostly double track. Here, maybe it's more because it's a, again, it's a long tail, but again, not very busy. They want to complete this. This is not a lot of money compared with current capital funding. Um. So, uh, New Jersey Transit needs to do it more extensively. New Jersey Transit has more diesel tails, and the Erie lines are entirely diesel. You want the same time. Um, you want high platforms, but thankfully the LRR is entirely high platform, and Metro North is, I think, also except for the water river branch. Uh, New Jersey Transit has, the, the Northeast Corridor is fully high platform, but everything else isn't, and that needs to change. Um, so I said, so you talked before about the um, issues of accessibility, right? Yeah, the towns, yeah, some of the parking lots are owned by the towns, but some of them are owned by the MTA, and the MTA should go nuts, and, uh, or, or if the MTA owns things on its footprint that it does not need, which Often, which often exists because often there might have been old station. I think in, um, I think in Stanford actually, I forget whether it was Metro North or Safety Dot that um, owned the infrastructure, but I don't think it was a parking lot. It just owned some land that that happened to be used as a parking garage that they wanted to redevelop. And yeah, the NMB screamed, but their Safety Dot they don't care. Um, and again, it ended up not happening, but not because of the NMB. So this is why. It, so it's kind of a very meta political argument. I keep telling people to uh, look at the near uh, misses. Uh, the town, I mean, the parking is, so if the parking is owned by the state, it should just not exist. Um, there, there's too much parking at these stations um, to the point that people only access them by parking. And then they do something called the, so in California, it was called the push model. The idea is that obviously the only right way to ride the train, try to peak. Um, and and, yeah, and Calvin has a lot of reverse peak that they didn't know what to deal with. Um, the only way to ride tra tra peak is that you will drive to wherever in the suburbs and then take the train to city center. And the only reason you might use a different station is if your parking lot is full. So the push model um, of Bob Doty and Caltrain. Uh, Bob Doty is someone who, Richard Mlynarek, has a para-antisocial relationship. I don't say para, para, and Bob Doty does not know who Richard is. He does. Uh, unfortunately, it does not listen to Richard's insights. Um, so the push model is that you would only go to a different station if the parking lot at one station is full. So they try to distribute the um, trains based on the parking lot um, and try to run express service based on that. Um, and that's a hot mess. And instead of that, they should have more access by uh, bus with uh, integrated ticketing and time transfers. Now, time transfers depend on frequency, and on a lot of the LIRR, it kind of pulls you to talk about time transfers, like on the Hempstead line. If you ask me how much ridership, uh, how much frequency this should have, um, if anything approaching full build out, the answer is at peak, this is every five minutes, this is also every five minutes. Before full build out, this is every 10, this is every time. Now, every 10 minutes, you can maybe do time transfer, and train train certainly, but train bus maybe not. But from here, this, it's, I think it should be five minutes all day. Um, the reason it should be five minutes all day is that it is, uh, these are pretty dense suburbs. Hampton is a pretty dense suburb, but that's maybe on a, on a branch. Uh, this, I mean, yeah, here there are golf courses. Uh, uh, I look at the golf course and I already imagine it as a bunch of beautiful condos. Um, in, in kind of the same way that I kind of look at, let's say, Ukraine, and I imagine, you know, a thriving EU um, and NATO member state. Um, and, um, and, and at any rate, it also is the kind of natural line to the local lines, to the local trends through the city. 
Um, so it should be very busy. And I mean, you're not going to talk about, I don't want to talk about time transfers on, the, on trains that come every five minutes. Five minutes is where you make untimed transfers, but stuff that comes every 15 minutes or only every 30, time will depart. I mean, we're actually doing a lot um, in the Boston plan for regional rail to figure out how to do the thing. And I don't know if it's in the Boston timetable. Let me actually check if I put it in the timetable when I drew it long ago. Let me see. Uh, no. But the timetable that I drew more recently would not have brought in at 48, 18 and 48 northbound. It would be at zero. So the point is that so this is blocked in 48. The, the number is uh, minutes after the hour every 30 minutes. Uh, I think it's all northbound. Um, and the symmetry axis is zero. And this is not a good idea. Um, and for the more recent timetable, we rewrote so that Brockton would be, I believe, zero or maybe one. And the point is that Brockton has is a bus transfer point. Why? That Brockton area turns that has a bunch of buses all of which convert here. Um, and uh, the uh, and one bus that instead of converging here just goes up into up to I think Ashmont here for the subway connection because the trains are too expensive. So for that you just, just make the train just make the trains charge the same fare as the buses and in this case it's a double fare bus plus subway. This is pretty far. Brockton is not that close to the city, so yes, it's okay to charge double fare on commuter rail. Again, the fare integration integration doesn't mean everyone pays the same. It means everyone. It means all modes pay the thing. And then you don't need to run that bus. And then you can run more local service that feeds the train station uh, every half hour. And then all the buses, and, and if it's Brockton zero, then it means that trains in both directions hit Brockton on the hour every half hour. Uh, this is thankfully a uh, double track. So this is so the train can pass here on a mostly single track line. And, uh, and then the buses are maybe going to hit Brockton. Let's say they're going to, on, on their cycle, hit downtown Brockton, let's say 55, 56 minutes after the hour, or 26 minutes after the hour. And then wait, driver goes to the bathroom, then the bus departs for five minutes after the hour, lather and repeat every half hour. So it's a time transfer everywhere to everywhere. This is when it trains run every half hour. Um, this is necessary, and this is in New York. It's not so. It's not going to be at the distance of Brockton because the distance of Brockton, New York, things that should be running every ten minutes. Um, but outer things in Jersey and Long Island, and maybe not Westchester, but um, certainly things like uh, not Newburgh. What is this? Beacon? Yeah. Um, they should do that, um, or in parts of Connecticut. And um, so, so again, better bus connections, and yeah, it's going to make people who are used to apartheid transit sand. South Africa is a better country now than it was, um, let's say, 30 years ago, let alone 50 years ago. So yeah. Um, and uh, better bike infra. Um, this also is where you're getting a big decision point on whether you're doing it Dutch style or German style. You, the US is so far German style. German style is you uh, bring the bike with you on the train. Uh, Dutch style, there are too many bikes for that, and I think German is slowly becoming more Dutch. Uh, the Dutch style is you don't bring bikes on the train, you just have bike parking at the station. At the station, and yes, technically parking, but let's compare the amount of space consumed by a bike and the amount of space consumed by a car. I have in my building, actually, we have car parking in the building. It's a new building. Some people think they need a car in the city. Uh, and yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, um, so in my building, uh, we have some car parking, and I sometimes accidentally enter the car, the, the underground parking garage, because I, uh, um, the the underground, uh, I have a basement storage space, and the door to the basement storage space looks the same as the door to the garage, and because I don't go there very regularly, I sometimes go through the wrong door, and then I see cars. Um, and we also have bike. But we also have bike spots, and I'm pretty sure that six bikes take the take less spot, less space than one car. And so, um, uh, and nobody is afraid that the bike's gonna run. I mean, yeah, might be afraid that the bike might hit them, but it's not the same as the, the fear they have from a car. And so, it's just much more walkable near a bike parking lot. So the point is that you just want bike parking lot at a place like Exville or Akama, and transit-oriented development and good um, feeder bike. Street and uh, buses that 
cars that are designed to connect with the trains rather than compete with them. Um, so that's for access. And as I said, it's difficult to do this with a very local system that unusually empowers the people who are uh, most who are, who are the biggest motorheads. Um, and that's true even in a place like New York, where in the city the majority of households are carless. Um, but again, some things you just don't need to care about. The locals think like land use at the train station as opposed to half a kilometer from the train station. Um, and then there's the, as I said, electrification. There's the accessibility issue is that they promised at the beginning that we talk about. Um, again, thankfully not a big deal in the LIRR or for the most part Metro North, but it's just an extent in New Jersey. Um, so the way it works is the correct thing you always need to do is to make sure that the train and the platform are at the same level. It doesn't matter what it is, but it needs to be the same level. Um, you can have very small, uh, you have very small gaps. The, uh, so if you want to get a person in a wheelchair to be able to get on and aided, the vertical gap, I think, so, so the US has legal limits, but the legal limits are never actually adhered to. Uh, in So I saw this in Barcelona. They actually did a study in Barcelona that essentially the American legal limits are for the most part correct for I think maybe 90th percent or something. So 90% of the time or 95% of the time a person in a wheelchair can get on an aided which is horizontal. So, and, and if you're willing to be not 90, 90 something or maybe 80%, or something like, I think you get maybe one and a half centimeters of leeway, maybe two centimeters of leeway vertically, and then horizontally around 10, if not. And this is very tight. Uh, and train wheels do wear out, and sometimes this is it's hard to achieve in practice, and essentially it's ignored even in America, where even in America, even in parts of America there are new lines and new trains. Um, and this is a terrible thing, and there is a solution which is called platform extenders, which I will actually look. Um, this is something that if the FRA, I know that three years ago it was considered. No. App colors. Um, so um, I know that the FRA was considering mandating that. I don't know if it actually did. And uh, you can click on this post, it's called Cap Fillers, and you can click on the video. Um, this slows down the train by something like three seconds per stop or something like that. It doesn't really matter. In Zurich, they managed, even with, uh, in Zurich, they managed to still have um, adhere to a 30 second standard per suburban stop. And I shouldn't say suburban, every stop that's not Zurich Cap And uh, so you want level boarding for people in wheelchair to be able to get on without a problem. And with the gap fillers, solve all these problems because the gap filler, I mean, you might have a gap, but the gap filler bridges it. I mean, you can have a big gap. You can have like a, let's say a platform that's 55 centimeters and a train floor that's a meter. That's just not going to happen. But you can fill in the difference of a, a couple centimeters and that's fine. Um, ver let's say vertically a couple centimeters. I think the uh, outer limit of these in uh, the United States. Um, what about auto height leveling suspension? I do not know. Um, does that exist in Japan? Because I know that in, because in Europe, in Europe the leveling suspension maybe there is a little bit of automation, but it does vary a little bit within a few centimeters. And um, so I have not seen, for the most part, so I shouldn't say well. So nearly every time I see a person in a wheelchair get on or off a train in Berlin, they manage to do they do so unaided. I remember one time that a person in a wheelchair in Neukölln on the U-Bahn uh, had to get the driver to get out of the driver's cab wheel them in, get a package with the driver's cab, and you think the entire operation lengthened the uh, dwell from the normal 30 seconds to maybe a minute, which is a very fast thing in the United States. It could be four minutes um, because there's a wheelchair lift. Or because in, in New York, it was just a little bit of a bump. And in the United States, the problem is that um, you don't in, in America, it's not like here. Here we have these mid-level platforms, and then there's rolling stock that has level boarding to these mid-level platforms of 55 and 76 centimeters. In the United States, it's polarized. It's either the full high platforms for old train heights, and I shouldn't say old because most high-speed rail in the world is that height. It's China and Japan, it's 
um, a meter twenty five in America, it's four feet. And uh, yeah, okay. So um, the the honestly should just not have station staff. Station station staff is human labor. Human labor is expensive. Don't do that. Um, and uh, instead, people should be able to get on unaided, partly as a matter of dignity, partly as a matter of efficiency. Um, and this requires these automatic gap fillers, which again is a normal pack. I mean, the the limit for horizontal uh, gap, I, I believe, is one foot on bars, which is unusually large. You should not plan on these. You should plan on I don't know, ten centimeters of that, and then if Maybe it's an, a weird platform or you need to deal with oversized freight or something, maybe, but otherwise, yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, they're working on My point is that in Berlin, it's kind of already a thing, and in Zurich, it very much is a thing. And I think in Leipzig, it's a thing. I saw it in Leipzig. Um, so, anyway, the. Um, uh, or maybe in Mannheim, I think, I think you've also seen it. So, so, the point is that in. I shouldn't say. My house is not in the city, the Rhine right car. Um, but so the situation is that you need to do that again, partly as a matter of dignity. Um, but the but the, the hard part is not that the hard that that's easy. The hard part is actually raising the platforms. And the raising the platforms bit from the American low level, which is eight inches, to the American high level, which is four feet, um, that's universal design actually, because it, yeah, I mean, even if it, you don't have the final thing with wheelchair. Accessibility, you're still turning a four minute operation that requires a lot of help into a one minute operation. And you also, but but also people in stroller, people not in strollers, people with strollers um, can just lift the strollers into like, yeah, over like a five centimeter gap or something. I mean, the um, or people in walkers can do that, or uh, people with very heavy wheeled luggage. It was not very nice to have to wheel luggage. Heavy, heavy luggage through the inaccessible, through the inaccessible Paris metro. So in Paris, um, I lived right near Nassion. Nassion is an RER stop, and the RER in the city is accessible. Um, and it was really nice because the way I would do it is I would, I had an elevator that would take me directly to the uh, RER platforms. And uh, so I would uh, fly, I would have uh, with my suitcase, with my um, roller, I would use the elevator and then get on the RERA, and, it, and they had the cross platform transfer to the RERB to the airport. It was really nice. But sometimes the elevator did not work, and then I had to go through the staircases just to get to the RERA, and that was really bad, with, especially when it was heavy, uh, a heavy suitcase, uh, um, a, a check in size, not a carry on size. Um, and that is and I'm able-bodied, and then it's much harder if it's a stroller. So we, um, I mean, with the, the load of the suitcase, I could just drag it down the stairs and yeah, it'll be noisy, but it's a subway station, other things are noisier. You can't do it with a stroller with a baby in it. Um, or you can't do it with yourself in a wheelchair. You can't just try to push yourself and, and hope that you're not going to crash at the bottom. Um, and, that's the, and, and that's going down, going up. I mean, that's different. No escalators? Um, no, not on the metro. Um, on the RER, yes. The, on the, the RER, there's escalators and elevators, but on the but the metro is stairs. Uh, and so the uh, and so the way that it worked is, um, so, so, so AM was just not very good, and I ended up missing a flight because of because 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 of that because it took me, you know, I think maybe seven minutes to get to the platform that way. And the seven minutes made the difference between just making the one hour deadline for checking the luggage and just missing it. Uh, and by the way, the uh, airport staff uh, sympathized because of that, plus train delays on a Sunday and rebooked me for free on the next flight. Um, I just had hours to tell the airport, but um. The, so, so you need to. So, what you need to do is raise the platforms. In the United States, thankfully, there's a standard. The standard is a very high platform, four feet. Whereas here, it would be mid-level. But here, there's so, 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 so many grandfather things. They're not even grandfathered in the sense that people are trying to go four feet or, or whatever. They're trying, um, but there's a standard. No, I mean the. Uh, I mean in Berlin, yeah, we have a uh, high platform. I forgot how high, but in Munich, for example, it's I think 960 millimeters. 
in the city center tunnel and then outside that it's maybe one step below that and then there are places that are mixed and it's a mess and paris is the same thing i think there, there are two different standards in paris and then uh, on the rrb and i think the train floor is a compromise between them so it's a either a step up or a step down on on some train i think on the rrc sometimes so it's a hot mess, and in the United States, you can fix the hot mess by just raising all the platforms to four feet. But that's money. It's not a lot of money, but it's money. Um, and um, this is per station going to be 20 million, I believe. Uh, more if you have Connecticut DOT cost control, but you don't need Connecticut DOT cost control. Even Boston cost control or Philadelphia cost control can get you to, to that. Um, so it actually has maybe 5 million or 7 million stations, just that they're um, smaller stations, uh, shorter stations, sometimes it's just one platform rather than two. Two platforms that are long enough for a New York Sky train, it's probably going to be 20 million, um, 25. Um, again, you don't need it here. You only, in in um, East of Hudson, this is the only place where I need that. But Jersey needs that a lot. Um, and often you have a lot of lines. So most of these stations are low platform. Um, and that needs to change. And that's going to cost on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, but it's hundreds of millions of dollars they're going to spend. Um, here maybe, uh, here's the next. The Northeast Carter, as I said, it's, a, it's uniquely all high platform. Um, so this so this is something that makes things a lot smoother. Um, you can stop. So, so I said before that um, you have stations as slow zones of zero kilometers an hour. Um, but then you also need to open the doors. Well, if you have high platforms, then, uh, and you have trains that have doors at the right locations, which they do in New York, then it's a 30 second dwell time. That's it. Um, you need auto, you need automatic doors, which New York has. You need to have them controlled centrally rather than by a conductor looking like this, um, and yelling all aboard or something. Don't do that, please. Um, please, you have the labor cost of New York, not the labor cost of Kinshasa. Um, and so the, this is a 30 second law. Maybe even less. Maybe even on a tail it would be less, not on a busier station. It, yeah, and at Penn Station, at Grand Central, it can be 60 seconds. In Russia, we're at Penn Station, it's you know, 90. Um, but um, without the running, it's maybe two minutes. That's it. And um, the. Um, and that's Penn Station, which uh, with, under an assumption in which the entire train doesn't Otherwise, yeah, I mean, 30 seconds. Um, and again, electrification, but that's already a thing there. Um, most of the, I mean, just fix the tails. Um, you definitely need to um, get the, uh, the, the platforms to be high where they aren't. You need a lot of, but you need a lot of good TOT interface, which means, again, walkability. It means bikeability. It means good bus connections rather than an assumption that everyone just drives to the train station. And yeah, a lot of people are going to complain. A lot of people are going to complain. Oh, yeah, I just drive to a better train station and I'm going to be pissed if you take that away from me. Yeah, well, the correct response of these people, okay, move to Florida, the city will be happier. Um, and the and it's, there's this mentality that you can't ever change things because someone will be pissed. Well, yeah, I mean, Pareto opti I mean, yeah, it's called Pareto optimality. It's a very fascist mentality. Like, literally, this was actually a thing in, in fascism, about how redistribution was bad because it wasn't Pareto optimal. Um, so, the, so, so, so the mentality you need to think is, like, you hate the like, like theory that do no harm mentality. Yes, yeah, some harm will be done to some people. Some of these people are people who the media thinks is, uh, who the media thinks are charismatic groups. doesn't matter. I mean... On that, it's a good thing. On that, even like to specific groups, like let's say racial minorities or poor people, it's going to be a good thing. Um, and um, the but again, and all but it's not some kind of political revolution. It's something that already can be done. You know, when the governor wants something done, it is done, and it doesn't matter who it harms. Um, and so, so a lot of this is just a matter of um, again getting the interface better. And some of the again, the, so the bikeability is harder because the do have more local empowerment there, unfortunately, but the DOD has, I mean, when it comes to stuff just at the train station, there isn't any local empowerment, not in New York, not in Connecticut, I don't think in Jersey either. It's just, 
just the point to think in terms of what power they can use to um, overrule and disempower and hopefully destroy um, the community. And um, again, but, but again, this is important as a matter of interface of what people take the train to, as opposed to how they take the train. So electrification matters for how people take the train. Um, having a good timetable, so with good off-peak frequency, with good reverse peak frequency, without these really weird express patterns that are designed often based on this kind of push model, and like obviously you just park at Hicksville, and the only reason you would just park, you would never park anywhere else, um, is or Ronkonkoma, if you're far, farther away, and the only reason you might do anything else is if the parking lot is full. No. Um, you want you want you want this kind of distance to use a train, not a car. Um, and so, again, it's a change that people are going to be pissed off at, but these are not people with any actual formal power, and even their informal power is a lot less than they think they do. Uh, and so the uh, mentality the, again, so the mentality should be about modernization, and this means. More modern schedules. By the way, they're going to be faster even for someone who takes the train from Hong Kong to the city. Um, they're just not going to make them feel special through escaping all the stops, not very high speed, because of uh, because of problems with reliability. So you want, so again, stuff like reliability, high frequency, trains with better acceleration. The, they derate the acceleration on the LIRR for stupid reasons. They don't need to. They can rewrite it back to. These are not very good, but are not terrible. Um, um, electrification, which again, the LIR is only missing from a handful of uh, um, from a handful of tails. Um, high platforms in terms of LIR are not missing, but are missing from a lot of New Jersey transit, unfortunately. But it's how people take the train. So they get on the train and it's this frequency and it's this speed and so on. Um, and that's really important to fix. That's going to be most of the cost of fixing stuff like. Um, the high platforms and the electrification, um, and this is the predominant cost of uh, the regional rail plan that we have been putting out for Boston. Um, frequency is not a capital cost. Frequency is an operating cost, but actually off-peak frequency is not an operating cost because most of the operating costs are actually determined by peak frequency. So stuff like crew needs, that's mostly a matter of the peak and not the base. Uh, rolling stock requirements, same thing. Maintenance scales with rolling stock requirements, not with how intensively you use the rolling stock. Um, I guess there's energy is the only for marginal cost of the service, and that's not a lot. Um, it's really not a lot, it's a very minor cost um, at the scale. And so, um, and, and, and so frequency is just better organization. It's not, um, but again, but it requires things like some kind of integration of the stairs, the timetables with um, with the buses, and then the entire integration of development. That's what the, that's not how people use the trains, but how, where they take them. So they take them between two places. This is literally travel between two places. So it's what there is at the origin and what there is at the, the destination. Um, and the, and so this is where stuff like um, earning this land use. Um, a lot of these are parking garages. I think this is a parking garage. In this. Um, so, turn, so replacing this land use with more supportive land use. Let me think what a good example of supporting land use near a train station would be. And I want to do with something, a place that I've actually been to. Um, it's not the best or better ones that I've seen, that I've seen through all Earth Resident in Asia, but this is, for example, a really good land use near a train station. It's not commuter rail, but it doesn't really matter. It is suburban. So let's say New West, and this is not a large city, right? Metro Vancouver is 2.5 million, so something like this um, would be better use, would be better land use. So um, and this is something that is not how the suburbs are used, but again, this is the, the, the buildings, if they're very close to the train station, you can overrule the NIMBYs. It's the bike infrastructure farther out where it's harder. Uh, or Metro Town actually is really good land use. Metro Town, uh, this is actually the second biggest sky train station because they've built all of this um, and this next to the, uh, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say next to it, they built this simultaneously with the sky train. 
Um, this is the second busiest, second biggest mall in the area. Maybe this is, I think this might be the fifth largest mall or something in Canada. Um, and so the, so, so this is good land use near a train station. What Hicksville looks like is not, and that is going to be harder because it is going to be telling people, yeah, your local community is deficient and we're changing it. You want, you have a problem with it. Do us all a favor and move to, um, and it moved to central Florida. Um, but, um, but, um, but that's, again, it's, it's something, it, it, it's a statement, again, it's very aggressive, but it's, it's still, it's something that can be made. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, there's not much that the Navy can do. Um, again, for stuff like the, for, for stuff like getting this to be a bikeable road, that's harder, politically. Um, but getting a lot of stuff here that's owned by the state to not look like this, I mean, yeah, they're going to complain, who cares? More powerful people have made bigger complaints about gubernatorial rail projects. Uh, the same LA, um, and, and, and I'll speak kind of like the LIA NIMBYs both Penn Station access. So this thing, this is a rail line that exists, but only for Amtrak. Um, so building these train stations, so Crop City, Palm Parkway, uh, not Palm Park, sorry, Palm Parkway is just my idea. Crop City, Mars Park, Parkchester, and Hunts Point, that's a project of uh, Andrew Cuomo called Penn Station Access. I mean, created Andrew Cuomo, but Cuomo made it his own. Hochul is keeping it as her own project. Um, Astoria, unfortunately, is not part of the project because they don't think in terms of fair integration. And without fair integration, people would just take the flagway. With it would be a pretty good uh, addition, I think. The constructability issues are non trivial, but they're not impossible. Because it's, it's on a grade and there are buildings here, so you need to build the platforms over some of the buildings, but that's okay. Um, and um, so the so, so this is called Penn Station Access. It's an incredibly expensive project because New York does not know how to do cost control. Um, but um, this was actually opposed by the Long Islanders, and the reason is that the train was supposed to... So all of these three tunnels already exist. These are existing and in use tunnels for the LIRR and Amtrak. As you can imagine, Amtrak was just often not most of the traffic. I believe the traffic is 37, per, uh, 37 trains per hour LIRR entering Penn Station between 8 and 9 in the morning, and Amtrak, I'm forgetting how many. I want to say four, but no, it's four from this direction here. It isn't. Um, this is a tunnel that was built in the 60s, actually, but it's still not connected to Grand Central. This is east side. So this tunnel is old. But the connection of the tunnel to the Long Island Railroad, I think, is just finished. And then the connection of the tunnel to Grand Central, so this tunnel, that's called East Side Access, and that's going to open very soon. Um, now, the Long Islanders believe that these tunnels are theirs by right. Uh, so having Metro North use the same infrastructure for them is the moral equivalent of... Uh, making them uh, all send their children to schools with black people uh, where they're going to be taught uh, that the United States may have had uh, racism in its uh, recent past. Uh, or for those people, it's sort of the moral equivalent of the Holocaust um, to, to have this kind of school integration. And so the... Um, and and uh, so it was supposed to be impractical when Island interested should not happen, absolutely. Uh, at most, you should think about it, and then after each side access opens, then you can maybe reevaluate and see, and even then maybe uh, it will just induce extra traffic, so all of this should stay LIRR. Uh, Long Island politicians, including ones that Cuomo relied upon to, uh, st to, to stem a Democratic majority um, in, in the state legislature, uh, the... Um, uh, so, so Republicans who we effectively worked with um, uh, from Long Island, like Nina Scalas, were against this. Uh, Helena uh, Williams, the head of the LIRR, was against Penn Station access. And then Cuomo decided that he wanted Penn Station access anyway. And at, the, at the time, he thought Penn Station access, which was an easier project, might open before ESA or maybe simultaneously with ESA. At this point, I think it's supposed to happen much later. Um, and then uh, Helena Williams, and, and then 
Corn decided, yeah, okay, I want transaction access. Uh, Helena Williams, uh, Helena Williams' uh, job title was realigned with her skills in the rail industry. That is to say, she was fired. Uh, and then suddenly, all these supposedly intractable, immovable forces in Long Island were silenced, and Penn Station access has proceeded has proceeded without a NIMBY hitch. There have been technical hitches. They have nothing to do with the Long Island NIMBYs. They have nothing to do with the fallout from old Long Island NIMBY problems. These NIMBYs, again, they melt to any kind of counterpressure from the state. Um, and it's something I wish people in the United States understood. Um, but the NIMBYs have essentially no formal power, and either their informal power is very limited. Um, and so, um, so, you, so you need to do that for stuff like TOD. But again, they're near, they're near misses. And as a, as a metapolitical point, near misses should count. So what I mean by near misses should count is that if you politically try something and you get very close and yet you do not succeed, it means that um, it is likely to succeed if you try again in the future. And yes, it should be a single entity. I mean, but also the MPA should be a single entity um, with the levels of integration. I mean, I wouldn't say with the level of integration of the MPA or SEPTA, but even those levels of integration, well, better than those of New York, are not especially good. I mean, you want integrated planning. You want train drivers to be a single pole with a subway. You want scheduling to move between them. And if there are good places for timed connections, for example, far Rockaway, then they should be done in the same way that here in Berlin, we have a time transfer, same direction between the U-Bahn and the S-Bahn in four to five. And um, I mean, I, I, I've shown this in old videos uh, many times before, but just but because I don't want my videos to be too interdependent, it's not like clicking on a blog link because it's an old video and maybe I don't remember the reference and maybe it's a specific time in a video that's multiple hours. So um, let me just show you guys this again. Um, so, as I said, the, you can see the trains is kind of gashes. Um, so this gash is the S-Bahn. Uh, and here is where the U-Bahn goes above ground, U5. And uh, here is the station where they meet, Fuletal. Uh, you might be able to see this, that um, you have this kind of flying track on. And uh, so the point is that it's cross platform in the same direction. The trains run every 10 minutes, all day. And the trains in the same direction, the Uban and Espan, uh, serve the station at the same time and they wait for each other. So you can interchange passengers in both directions. So things like this. And this is again, and, and this is not even the same entity. Um, the Uban is BBG, so a city agency. The Espan is Deutsche Bahn, national. Uh, and so, the, um, where such interface exists in New York it should be timed when plausible. So, when not when trains are running every three minutes or five minutes, but every 10 minutes, yeah, or 15. Um, so, Far Rockaway is a good place for this because Far Rockaway has the subway. Um, and I don't think the LIR is at the same station, but they're close, and one of them should be. I mean, they were part of the same line that's looped, so that you can still see the gash just extend one to the other. Um, and again, make, make it so that people can very easily transfer. Uh, transfer with, with buses. Uh, again, it's not just, so again, same labor pool, same planner pool. I mean, the planner pool also needs to be fully replaced at the LIR and Metro North, just not. People are very good at their jobs. Um, certainly not their, I mean, maybe the junior people are salvaged, but the senior people are just never going to be good. Um, like someone who, earns not a lot of money and stuff that their job can learn from a Swiss planner on um, 80,000 francs or 90,000 francs or someone who's earning 200k a year old and never will. So, um, um, so again, the senior management at all these railroads probably needs to, like Helena Williams, have their position realigned with their skills in the rail industry. I mean, there's no way that, for example, someone like Gretchen Draske should um, be working with this, like, it's, it's not so much malevolence, it's just severe incompetence. Um, again, the junior people can learn. Um, and, um, and so, so, so it's a bunch of things. So it's about, so it's a 
So, so, if you, so it's understanding that the near miss in Stanford does not showcase that the NIMBYs are smaller than they are weak, so you actually can do TOD. Um, and so, so you make sure that people have more steps to take the train to and from. This is literally TOD. The whole point of TOD is the, to make sure that the development is where the trains go so that you're not going to be in this weird situation in which people are worried that they can drive everywhere, but the train only takes them to a handful of places. But rather, they can think that, oh, the train takes them to everywhere they want to go, but they can, but if they drive, yes, in theory, they can go to all these same places, but those places have traffic and insufficient parking. And it doesn't even need to be a deliberate policy for them to have insufficient parking. Like, I mean, in New York, it's not like anyone made a policy to limit the amount of parking. Yes, they've, been, they've had residential parking maximum for the last couple of decades, but only for new development. And they haven't had a lot of new development in the part of Manhattan, in, in, in really anywhere in New York, but in the part of Manhattan uh, where they have parking maximums, which is, I believe, south of West 110th and East 96th. Um, I mean, a little bit of development, but not a lot. I mean, the, the lack of parking is just a matter of the highest and best use in, like, like in Midtown Manhattan is not a parking lot. It is a 300 meter tall skyscraper and the highest and best use not Manhattan, but a place that's relatively close to Manhattan, let's call it Jackson High. I mean, the highest and best use here is probably a 30 story condo. Second best would be a seven story, like six story, something like this. This would be second best. These fourth best. Um, so, um, so, so that is actually a QD. It means making it easy for people to um, have things to take the train to. And just as a reminder, the sort of rent that I pay in Berlin that makes literally every German stare at me like I told them that I, uh, uh, that, that as a hobby I buy diamond rings and then catapult them into the lake, never to retrieve them again, um, that rent is remarkably cheap. By New York standards, because New York because New York is that desirable, people want to live in New York. I mean, I'm pretty sure that I mean in New York that I mean I'm not pretty sure the New York of today's rent. I mean not today but pre-corona um, was still. I mean for me it's a job thing, but but still it was desirable enough that for me as a very European person. I actually had to think long and hard on whether I was going to move there. And again, it was really, it was job related. Um, it, it was productivity related. Um, but there were other issues and I decided to stay in Berlin and I made the correct decision in retrospect based on Corona and even the, th and even the things that were most glaringly bad about New York, like the traffic on the streets were coming from the same place really as Cuomo's inability to deal with Corona. I shouldn't say inability. Unwillingness to deal with Corona. Uh, malevolent unwillingness, and um, and so in New York, people want to live there, even with his horrendous rent. People want to live in New York. You, so, so part of it has to be a TOD strategy, which is not just about regional rail, because um, so so the places in New York where you have the most undercrowded trains. So, so so part of it is regional rail because just the commuter trains in New York are just less crowded than the subway. When people say the LIR is overcrowded, what they mean is I need to sit in the middle seat. When people say the subway is overcrowded, what they mean is I can't, I don't have enough room to get on the train and stand at um, 8.30 in the morning. Um, but it's on every subway line. Uh, so for example, in Brooklyn, most of the subway lines are underfall because Brooklyn is below peak population. Uh, and moreover, um, so I talked before about the topology of various job centers. So I talked about primary CBDs like Midtown and Lower Manhattan, uh, historic secondary downtowns like downtown Newark, downtown Brooklyn, Flush, uh, not Flushing, Flushing, Jamaica, um, uh, and then spillover, so Newark spillover um, sec uh, uh, mix centers of the CBD um, like uh, the Jersey City waterfront or Long Island City. Uh, edge cities like uh, Stanford uh, and uh, uh, and White Plains and uh, uh, and the New Brunswick Edison uh, 
uh, complex, which is actually very big in life sciences, so this place is likely to keep booming. Pfizer, by the way, uh, Pfizer is headquartered in New York. Um, Pfizer is New York, Moderna is Cambridge, Massachusetts, so expect these places to be uh, more in demand as biotech suddenly becomes big. Um, normal tech also expands its uh, footprint in these cities. Um, uh, but Pfizer, I think, has a lot of labs specifically around uh, here. Um, and, uh, or Bell Labs actually was pretty big here. Yeah. So old, uh, old tech, by the way, Macro, was here in Door 128, and Silicon Valley was like a weird place that people were moving to. Um, but, um, so, so there's that, and there's Agile Cities, which is like this, but much less that. So the historic secondary downtowns have been in decline. Um, and, uh, but downtown Brooklyn is the same direction for most of Brooklyn as Manhattan. So essentially, um, even though so um, commuting in Brooklyn, like downtown Brooklyn has very much declined, but it's been replaced with commuting on the same lines for the most part of the same place. Uh, not the same place, but in the same direction as it is to Manhattan instead of getting off of downtown Brooklyn. The big exception, by the way, is Williamsburg. Uh, Williamsburg has a big increase in commuters to Manhattan, so the L, uh, so the L train, is uh, very crowded uh, due to electronic issues, uh, due to, electron to electronics issues, the electrical capacity, the frequency there, the brush hours kind of mess. Um, but, but everything else in Brooklyn is very underfold by uptown Manhattan or Queens standards. So you want to do a lot of zoning here. And that's on regional rail territory. I mean, I had talked at the beginning of this video a little bit about the Enterbar Express, but the Enterbar Express, that's not taking people to jobs in Manhattan, that's taking people from Bay Ridge, where there might be industrial, but there might be industrial jobs, but not many. And um, Brooklyn College, which is a nice destination, but it's not a big destination. East New York, which is just a, jun which is a junction, but not really a job center. Uh, Jackson Heights, Jackson Heights is not a job center either. So um, uh, Jackson Heights is an ethnic community center. This is a kind of thing which is not a job center. These are so. Um, so sometimes when you have enclave groups, um, they have specific neighborhood centers that you don't really see in job data. And this is a deficiency of data collection, which is something that urbanists and transport and public transport advocates are aware of. It's just very hard to find better data. Um, and a lot of them, unfortunately, have relied on surveillance stuff as a result. Things like uh, here is uh, uh, here here is our sur uh, surveillance data on people who use our app, which introduces its own biases. For example, these apps are not universal, um, and uh, so and even smartphone ownership is not quite universal, and it's especially not universal among enclaved groups. For example, uh, for, for example, first generation immigrants who don't speak the language uh, don't always have a smartphone, especially older ones. Um, among the younger people, it's universal already. I think in 2017, I was asking. I have a friend who is a uh, math teacher in, uh, who is a high school math teacher uh, in Newark. Uh, it is inner city, so so, and it's not fancy Newark. It's in, in normal inner city, not inner city, inner city Newark public school. Um, and uh, and, and this person told me, maybe in 2015, it was a, I kept asking about smartphone ownership to, to understand how universal it was. In 2015 or 2016, what he told me was that 75% of the students own smartphones. But by 2017, it was 95% and said, oh, yeah, it's really uh, one of the things that I do is that if, they, if I see them text in class, I take their smartphone and I only let them have it back at the end of the day. Um, so, if, so for... Uh, well, I guess they were 17 or uh, in 2017. So, uh, I don't even say it's 2000s, maybe not the last. Yeah, yeah. So, Zillennials, let's call them that. Um, so, Zillennials have universal smartphone ownership, even in a very poor way of standards um, and, and very segregated place. But um, for people who are, let's say, 60 and don't speak any English, maybe not. Now, obviously, if it's a, let's say, 30-year-old who's just come in from China and uh, they're not very well integrated, so they speak poor English, but they're very integrated into the China, into millennial China. They uh, have a smartphone and they have WeChat groups where they uh, hear, where, where they um, exchange, uh, uh, where they exchange horrifically racist 
memes with other um, unassimilated Chinese workers. Um, WeChat in America is, uh, is, a, is a locus of um, very reactionary attitudes toward, um, other, uh, toward other minority groups, a lot of uh, fear-mongering about black crime and Hispanic crime. Uh, and uh, so, um, but these people still are on smartphones, but maybe not the apps that are used for, maybe, I mean, I shouldn't say maybe not the apps that are used for surveillance. WeChat is a Chinese surveillance app, but maybe not the ones that are used for this kind of data. So, um, so job data is the one that's most reliable um, because you don't need to rely on job surveillance, uh, surveillance apps that miss certain people, but it is understood that you miss certain classes of travel and there's ethnic travel. Um, so you have ethnic business centers, like Flushing is a huge one for Chinese New Yorkers, Jackson Heights for Indian New Yorkers, uh, Harlem is very well recognized for black New Yorkers. And, um, and, and the thing is, you generally don't see them in job data, but you see them in travel data. So um, DC, let me see if I can find the data for, for DC, uh, Washington Metro data station to station. Let me see if I, if I can get this. It's not going to be, oh, it, was it, is it going to be from the open data? No, it's going to be from that. Shit. Oh, this. So I think it's from here. Uh, and this data is a couple of years out of date. Uh, I do not know if they have more recent stuff. So um, DC, unlike New York, make, uh, has, uh, has uh, distance-based fares. Um, distance-based fare, um, and specifically, to, uh, and because it's fare gated, I mean, I guess all of America so it's fare gated, but it's fare gated entry and access, so they can tell uh, entry and exit stations paired, unlike New York, which can only tell entry stations. Um, and so um, you can actually see in the data that the two main black centers, the two main centers of black Washington uh, are uh, Southeast D.C., so that's uh, uh, so this is this entire uh, region uh, whose main center is Anacostia, uh, and uh, the other is at the other end, kind of the city on the Green Line. It's called Columbia Heights. So it's a complex of a bunch of things. So it's stuff like Howard U, uh, U Street uh, is a commercial drag, and Columbia Heights is a neighborhood. Now Columbia Heights at this point is not, I don't think it's majority black anymore. It's one of very few places in black America that have actually gentrified in the sense of becoming majority white, or if they've not become majority white, it's, come, it's very close to that. Um, usually gentrification in the United States, kind of racial gentrification in the United States really just means it's not a black, but an ethnic white group, and it's not displacement, it's the community, let's say Jews on the Upper West Side, Poles in Williamsburg, uh, Greeks in Astoria, these people just assimilate to America, they move to where, um, assimilated Americans live, so the same suburbs that those assimilated Americans' parents and grandparents moved to to get away from the Jews and Poles and Greeks. Um, and uh, then, uh, so, there's, so it's kind of a two-way exchange between uh, a historically ethnic neighborhood and a historically WASP suburb as the ethnic uh, marker ceases to be important. Uh, and that's not the case with Black America. Black America is not actually assimilating. Um, and Columbia has, again, it's a very rare case of actual gentrification as opposed to a neighborhood going from 90% black to 70% black, and the difference is mostly not white people but Hispanic, um, which is what's happening in Harlem. Uh, and um, so, but anyway, um, so you won't see, so if you check things, so if you check on the map and check where people live in Anacostia work, they work in the same place as anywhere else in DC. I mean, maybe. Uh, maybe there's some of a compositional issue because Anacostia is a working class neighborhood. So maybe there's a little bit of a compositional issue because the um, because working class people in the United States work fundamentally the same places as the middle class, but there's somewhat less downtown central. But relative to that composition, it's exactly what you'd expect. But then when you look at station to station ridership, you will actually see the connections between Anacostia and Columbia Heights. Um, they're not huge, but they're there. They're visible. Um, a couple hundred riders a day. Um, so you do have ethnic business centers, like, um, so, um, so, so these would be things like Columbia Heights for Black Washington, and Black New York, um, it's stuff like uh, Harlem, um, with institutions like the Apollo. Um, again, Indian New York would be Jackson Heights, Chinese New York is Chinatown and Flushing, uh, 
Korea, New York would be Koreatown, but Koreatown is a spit distance. I want it is a spit distance from Midtown, it's like Thirty Second Street. Um, to the point, I mean, it might actually be a literal spit distance if you start. I mean, I'm pretty sure you, if you spit from the, the Observatory of the Empire State Building, and you, you can probably hit Thirty Second, right? It's like only one block, I guess. So it's literally a spit distance from the Empire State Building. Maybe the maybe it's not very visible just because the. Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, there's going to be some Korean travel or non-Korean travel for people who like um, to spend twenty five dollars on bulgogi uh, into uh, uh, into this area. But um, this is the Empire State Building is here. Penn Station is here. Macy's is here. Times Square is here, so maybe uh, this is not going to be a, an especially visible kind of travel in the same way that um, you can't see the stars during the daytime. Right? I mean, when, when you do astronomical observations, you do them at night. It's not that the stars are all turning off from sunrise to sunset, right? You can't, see, but you act, but I mean, it's that you're not going to be able to see a, let's say, first magnitude star when you have the fucking sun, which is, I believe, ma um, apparent magnitude negative 20 uh, in the sky. What's the sun's apparent magnitude? Negative 26, 74. Uh, I believe the system is that um, five magnitudes are a factor of 100. Um, and I believe brightest star in the night sky is about zero, give or take, or maybe negative one. So yeah, you're not going to see stars in the daytime. You're not going to see ethnic travel into into Koreatown. We are going to see ethnic travel into uh, again to Flushing. So actually, when we're talking about the interborough, the um, we were, it's not going to be a big job thing. But yeah, absolutely, people. And I mean, Sunset Park here are going to do hmm, to Flushing. Um, Again, maybe, even, I mean, I mean, there's part, I mean, some fluency in the city. A lot of people don't speak English to stride the Chinatown buses, which uh, exist between the Chinatown, so between uh, Chinatown, Flushing, and South of the Park. I think they might have actually predated the intercity ones, the Fung types that had very cheap uh, and not very reliable buses between Chinatown, New York, Chinatown, Boston, um, until um, more middle class facing things like. Bolt and Megabus saw the market, got in, and then when that existed, the regulators figured out that Fung breaks every regulation and the book and shut them down. Um, but this is, again, it's kind of travel, again, with, even with the even with the subway, stuff that, I don't want to call it regional, right? Like, I mean, can you run regional trains on this? Yes, I can. I mean, I suspect that they should be running subway trains, but that's not an important question. The important, I mean, for Logical purposes. For typological purposes, what matters is what kind of service are you running. So regional rail, the whole point of it is that you're running the suburban trains and the urban trains on the same line. Or rather, I mean, you're running urban and suburban service on the same train. So the whole point of regional rail, I'm going to get back to my uh, crayon just because it illustrates that, um, is that um, so maybe the red colored line, so the one I call line one is not terribly interesting, but let's let's actually do the orange one line three just because it's stuff that requires very little infrastructure. Like infrastructure not being proposed, like it because so this line three exists and runs only Amtrak service. There were plans for Penn Station access to do FRIP and FRIP and only this FRIP is actually happening, unfortunately. This I'm not sure why, but um now for optimal so, so this connects to Penn Station, but I think Cracks here, and this is a short tunnel that I think should be built um, for realignment. But, um, but again, not a big deal compared with Gateway, compared with Grand Central, compared with all the other things. Like, um, so this is about to exist, but this is pure crayon. This is pure crayon. This is definitely pure crayon. Um, so, so anyway, um, the um, so so, let, so I just want to focus on the orange color line and line three. Just, it's probably the best illustration of that. Um, so the whole point is that you have urban and suburban service on the same line. So the suburban service is to um, the East Garden City Nassau Center place in Hempstead, um, where it's 
and suburban, but built suburban. And then yeah, here it's just golf courses. As I said, I see a golf course. You can see it is a beautiful um, forest of condos. Uh, and uh, but more importantly, so so this is kind of the unimportant part. It would also be suburbs and could also be a brand. But then this is the important part. So through the city, the point is that these interline. So bank and then double bank. So it's price the frequency, and this is how you can get very good frequency in the city. Um, and it's again maybe a different on the red color line because within the, you have branching within the city, and this is gonna and it's all gonna be handled with track sharing with um, intercity trains. Uh, but uh, like, like in New York, like they're always, I mean, you never have a purely commoditized investment system because they're all because it's all based on. Uh, using existing infrastructure and, re and reusing it, and they're always weird things. Uh, so here's an example of a weird thing. This way, this way, as opposed to just one trunk. Um, this trunk is also a really good example of this. It's just that um, this is something that I can see happening in the next 15 years if people actually listen to me. This, I mean, also, but that requires a lot more listening to me. And, um, this is a lot more slack out is my point. But actually, this is a good example. So you have this kind of urban background where the whole point is to interline all of these things. So this branch, this branch, this branch. Um, this is maybe a longer thing, but it runs the suburbia branch. Um, and likewise, at this end in Jersey, northern branch, like all the area lines, so the northern branch, uh, Pascack Valley line, um, the uh, Bergen County line, and the main line, which I kind of hate the name main line because the old year main was not this, the old year main. So this is actually the old Bhutan branch of the Lackawanna. So the Lackawanna had, so the, again, the year in Lackawanna used to be two different railroads. They merged, and then I think within 10 years, they became, they went bankrupt. Um, Erie, the New York and Erie went like this. So it went from Erie up until, so on the main line, it went like this. So not this, this is, uh, more modern. So the old line, you can kind of see the gash. It goes like this, uh, and uh, then it went through Rutherford, and you can vaguely see the old remnants of the line uh, through Passaic and Patterson, and then the rest is just a continuation of the main line. Um, and it was really curvy and was not that useful for passenger rail. And uh, uh, and they tried running, but they were activated by the New York Central and went up to Port Sherfa. Like the whole point was um, when they first started running, it wasn't even going through here. It was they had a terminal uh, here, and then they somehow wended their way like this before realizing that this is just much closer to New York City than this. Um, so the whole point was uh, to start doing it purely on the New York side. Um, we're still starting west of the Hudson, and uh, then they filled in with this, and they built the northern branch to connect Erie with, to, to connect this terminal with this terminal, um, and become kind of a commuter railroad. Like they, again, they, they had services went all the way up to Buffalo, um, and then you had the Lackawanna, which started here. Uh, Hoboken went. This is the main line went trip, 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 trip. all very curvy, uh, something like. Is up to Stroudsburg, and now they're talking about reactivating a cutoff called the Lakona cutoff that was just much faster during trip, and but then horrifically curvy up to Scranton, and then they end up in Bangor, and essentially the same place as Erie. So they merged so that instead of running two lines like this that were as fast as from each other, were not one, and then there was a question of do they use the Erie side like this to get to New York or the Lakona side. Um, so they ended up cutting a lot because it was the 1960s and a lot of, a lot of return front. Um, so for example, this is where the Erie realigned itself from here, which is the historic terminal, um, from the Pavonia to Hoboken, which is why today all of these trains go to Hoboken. Um, there was something called the Boontown branch, which was uh, one of the cutoffs used by the Lackawanna. Um, so, the, so what is called the Lackawanna cutoff is this one. I don't think it's very visible. It's roughly like this. Um, and then there was a cutoff called the Boonton branch, which is this. And this is why I'm slightly annoyed calling this the main line. The old main line is this. It's very central through Passaic. It was just uh, removed, I think, because there were a lot of grade crossings and there were more cars and the people were 
annoyed at the trains or making them stop at the grade crossings, so they just kept the trains. Uh, so what they did with the uh, so the Lakawana went like this. This is for, this is historically Lakawana, not Erie. And then all of this is historically Lakawana up to Patterson, where um, roughly from somewhere in Patterson, I never remember where. So you can kind of see this is where they joined. Um, I think around here they uh, went like this. On what is essentially the right of way of I eighty. Not essentially, literally, IAT uses that right of way. And they went like this, and you can see the remnants here at downtown Patterson, and then they go here. And the whole point is that this was just a much lower grade and faster bypass of this bundle of pain. Um, this was caught again in 1960s or Tantrans. Um, they built IAT, and they even offered the way then merged Era Lackawanna to preserve the Boonton branch as a single track. It had been true. They said, no, we don't need that. Let's cut it. Um, so for the Boonton branch, they, instead of doing this, they went like this. This is partly Erie, partly, this is partly Erie branch, partly the Boonton branch, which is not as well built as this, like um, steeper grades and so on. And these were railroads that were falling coal. Uh, grades matter. For passenger rail, it doesn't. It doesn't really matter what the grade is, but the curves are kind of insane. Um, and then they uh, also caught, and they were also killing the Erie Main, so they merged the lower Blunton, the, the lower um, Blunton branch with this, and turned it into the new Erie Main. Uh, so maybe so, and I'm not even saying this is a they should restore the old Erie. I mean, maybe they should, but maybe they should not sure, to be honest. Um, I'm just pointing out that you have all these suburban branches, really. Uh, which should have suburban frequency, you know, during every 15 minutes or something. Uh, in Berlin, it would be every 10 to every 20, depending on what, um, how central the suburb is. And then the interline from General Square. And again, all this is crayon, but it's crayon that I think, I think this is probably the purest explanation of the concept of regional rail. This very crayony yellow R5 line. Um, and then from General Square, across the Hudson, through Brooklyn, up to Jamaica, it's an urban line where these lines interline. So if it's four lines that run every 10 minutes, then from uh, General Square to Jamaica, it's every two and a half. Um, and same thing, if you have, let's say, three lines that interline, let's say Babylon is basically a search on double surface, so it's five, ten, ten. Um, let's say five, and then ten, ten, and this is five. Uh, then here it's two and a half, um, and this is a two and a half minutes is an urban frequency. Not even a Berlin urban frequency. Berlin urban frequency is every five minutes, uh, maybe maybe every four. I think the Stadt one is every three minutes twenty. Um, not just for in general, because a lot of things come together. But five minutes is needed enough in Berlin. It's just a handful of times. And I mean, when you have three ten minute lines on the on the uh, Stadtbahn and on the Nordic Tunnel. In, in Berlin, yeah, 10 divided by 3 is 3.5. Three uh, not 3.5, three sorry, 3, and, so three minutes 20. And, uh, and so the... Um, so this is the, the concept of regional rail. The, um, is the urban train is also the suburban train. So from the perspective of the urbanite, I mean, I don't need to remember which train goes where. I don't go that far into the suburbs. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I happen to know which branch of the S1 goes wherever because I'm a giant dork. And so I look at the maps, I maybe take rail fan trips, so I happen to know uh, which S bahn service hits Stausberg, which hits uh, Erkner, and, and, and which uh, which hits Einsfelde and, and, and so on. But the average city center user doesn't need to care. It's all the same. And yeah, maybe they're slightly off schedule, but it's fine. I mean, yeah, okay, so instead of having, instead of the, nor the expected three minutes 20, I have to wait four minutes for my train or five minutes. This is terrible. I will write a letter of complaint that I had to wait one additional minute for my train. How dare you? This is awful. I wish to speak to the manager. Um, and so the um, but in the suburbs, again, it's different. You look at a timetable. It's, it's a different way of timetabling from doing your urban subway because if it's a pure urban line, the entire line is in a who cares about the schedule. 
the duration. This is the issue with the antiviral thrust. The antiviral thrust is just not going to have this brand thing. Um, I mean, in theory, it can, but not really. I mean, wh where would you even place branches? I mean, it's a, circ it's a circumferential line, so what branches? Um, and so stuff like interbar, which would be, again, the governor's version would be script. The version I think is optimal is script. And then a little bit of using existing tunnels, a little bit of Greenfield tunnels to get through Melrose and, uh, and Yankee Stadium. And, uh, uh, and so the, uh, and so that is a line where conceptually you don't care about the timetable. I mean, you care about frequency, but nobody's ever going to look at a timetable. Nobody ever looks at a timetable when things are on every five minutes or every second minute. You don't know if people look at a timetable when things are on every seven and a half minutes. People look at a timetable when things are on every time. Absolutely. Um, and so because you don't have the kind of branch structure, I mean, maybe you don't need to plan that way, and that's fine. Um, so yeah, maybe that's going to be regional rail by technology, but by conception, no, it's not. That's okay because this is going to be regional rail by concept, even if you, for some reason, run subway train, um, or, or or on the LIRR, or, or on the New Haven line, or on the Harlem line, or so on, or or and the same thing in Boston, where um the there's a little bit of retro crayoning in Boston. So let me pull this together again. It's, don't look at the timetable. I mean, the, at, the, at the timetable, we've had a better one. Um, the, uh, so, so these lines, for example, and then specifically talking about the yellow ones, so that would be the old colony lines. Um, there's a little bit of a retro crayon because, so these used to be commuter lines of the old colony railroad, old colony because their original line connected Boston with Plymouth. Uh, and uh, the old uh, and, and the old colony lines uh, shut down, I believe in the 1950s, uh, specifically because they were about getting white flighters from the suburbs to the city. And they shut down the day that this expressway route uh, Ma um, route 3, Massachusetts Route 3. So this was viewed as a replacement for the uh, this was viewed as a replacement for the railway. It was actually a very innovative highway design. They, uh, I think this, um, they did a lot of studies on this highway uh, as it was being built so when it was in uh, so when it was completed but not yet opened for, for travel. They did some studies on this uh uh, to check uh, uh, road safety, they did things over things where they had the thing where they had people drive on it, wearing a helmet that would constantly uh, do this to them, so they would uh, con that would uh, rotate between uh, covering their eyes and not covering their eyes to see whether they could still concentrate on the road. And obviously, you can't do it on a highway that is being used by commuters because if the test fails, then it's going to be crashes and people are going to die, but if it's a highway that is complete but does not yet have normal cars on it, then yeah, you can do a test driver and yeah, maybe, and a test driver takes the job understanding that it's not as safe in the same way that you have test pilots, in the same way that there are jobs that people understand are unsafe, right? I mean, again, things like roofers, like, like laters, um, I think that might be the most dangerous in the United States. Uh, fishermen know that they might uh, be lost, the ship might be lost at sea, um, test pilots, test drivers. Um, I won't say soldiers, but I actually think there's a death rate in modern armies from what modern armies do, which is coin. Uh, and I, I don't think these death rates are very high. Um, and so the, um, and so the mentality, and so this was actually a really innovative hydro zone, but the point is that it was supposed to be instead of the commuter lines, the commuter lines shut down, I think, the day that the highway opened for general traffic. Then they realized, oh shit, uh, we actually need some rail service here. There's too much traffic in the 1980s. So they didn't right away rebuild these commuter lines. The, what they did is they took the red line, so the subway line, uh, which originally just went with a single line that so it went through Cambridge, the busiest line, because at the time it went through Harvard, they would subsequently extend it from Harvard to Alewife like this. So, so the line started in 
Dave Phillips, of course, I went. Harvard under Mass Ave, Central Square, Kendall Square. Then it, uh, it actually crosses from Cambridge to Boston on a bridge and onto a tunnel. You can see the road. Um, and then it goes back into a tunnel. Uh, sort of downtown Boston, South Station. South Station is the busiest station, part of where the red line is. Um, it goes a little over here, and then to and then goes above ground at uh, Columbia, which is the Columbia Road, which is the access, which is the access to um, um, UMass Boston and the JFK Presidential Library, where you can read things like how you can be a completely mediocre uh, um, Harvard legacy, and yet people will think that your administration was intellectual because they think that your fellow Harvard legacies are the best and the brightest, um, and how you can be a complete failure and still have very high um, approval rate. And then it went on what was historically a commuter branch of the New Haven line. Uh, and I say the New Haven line. I mean, up to the old colony line, but by the 1920s when it was built, all of this was owned by the New Haven line, by the New Haven line. Um, that went through Dodge, through Dorchester. It went like this, and you can see it. Um, and, and, and one of the ways you can see it's historically a railroad is that things that were built as subways usually in America were built under roads. And even in Britain, where they are um, deep ward, usually you can kind of see what roads they were supposed to follow. Um, and uh, in, so for example, most of the ride line, again, as I said, it's Mass Ave, uh, Maine. Um, here they're a little bit, they cut off a little bit, but here it's then Summer Street, and then here it's, uh, and here it's Thought Ave to some extent, and then... Uh, but here it's completely independent of the street grid, which, is, which indicates it was a historic railway that was maybe built before the, these areas uh, were dense urban neighborhoods. Um, so they just bought off the line from the New Haven, and uh, up until Ashmont, it was a subway station. I this is Ashmont. I'm already getting the stop on. No, this is Ashmont. Okay. And then the line continued onward, but this was not dense enough, so they made it a streetcar called the Mattapan High Speed Line. It's not actually high speed, it's a streetcar. Um, and they keep trying to figure out what to do with it because the streetcars are about 700 years old, not terribly reliable, not terribly fast, high maintenance, and they're thinking about making it BRT as opposed to, let's say, extending the subway across them. Um, but anyway, so this is the, the historic part of the red line. And then they realized, oh shit, we need uh, more rapid transit in this area. So what they did is they took a, and if they edited a branch through the branch through the red line called the Braintree branch. It actually so it branches off at JFK Mass, goes along the railway through Seven Hill, which it does not serve because Seven Hill has remember I said Dorchester has a diverse population. Uh, yeah, this is where all the people went because they were worried that the uh, that their children might go to school with black people. Um, yeah, you can shift green line stuff, but um. The um, but the line, but they they have other problems. Like all of the like the old Green Line trains are not terribly good either. Um, and it's an orphan line. It's also a weird thing about frequency. Like I, I said at the beginning of this video that the Princeton Dinky is nice because they actually time it with the Northeast Carter, at least in the New York to Princeton direction. Not so much transfer to Princeton. They just expect you to drive that. But um, here they don't time this because these are small trains. So the trains, it's kind of weird. The trains they run every five minutes. These trains run not every five, not every ten. Uh, but I think it's every eight peak or nine minutes peak, and then every 14 minutes off peak. So the frequencies don't match. Um, light rail in the United States in general has this kind of high operating cost. Um, and it's a bunch of people who think that buses are more modern than trains because they are A, not good at their jobs, and B, they're stuck in thinking from 30 years ago when people thought that BRT was new because it had been tried once, and the one place that tried it, that is to say, Kuritiba, actually did as part of the general cost control program. Um, at any rate, and also had the you know, labor costs of Brazil. Uh, so anyway, they built this branch of the uh, uh, red line in the same right of way as the railway. Um, pulling back the railway to a single track, which is creating a lot of bottlenecks right now. Um, and uh, again, skipping Seven Hill because Seven Hill's population is not the same skin color as the population of Quincy and Braintree, and then they went to Quincy and Braintree with a bunch of stops here. Um, 
Um, one of which, I think called Quincy Adams, is a garage where the uh, where there's a fence uh, with a uh, with, with a locked door or something from the nearby uh, from nearby housing, and the drivers like to keep it that way because they are mortally afraid of the people who live near the station. Uh, so the walkway to the station from people who live right near there is actually really circuitous. Um, this is Boston. So this is 1980s. Now in 1990s, really, it's not enough, and they need to push it out into the suburbs. And so they do it uh, by restoring the old colony lines with a lot of single tracking. Um, some of it can be double tracked very easily. Some of it not so much. We actually had a lot of long technical discussions at uh, TM trying to figure out how to uh, schedule things around the bottleneck and try to avoid having to double track things where you need to actually buy off housing. Um, at any rate, uh, so these were restored, I think, 1991. These were restored in 1999. And not all the way here, only to middle ground. This is, I want to say crayon, but it's kind of official state crayon, and the state and the trains already do it at, uh, on weekends for weekend travel to Cape Cod, because the, the, the whole point is that this line is commuter travel peaks weekday. This line is leisure travel peaks weekend, so they run separate services. What I would say is regional is just use the same train and use the fact that these are different peaks to have a uh, flatter service all day, every day. Um, okay, so anyway, this and this works already, I believe, might be nine, and this 2003, I believe. Um, or rather, restored up to here, not all the way to downtown Plymouth, which is a giant problem. Uh, and so the, uh, and so anyway, this is regional rail, and again, the, uh, so again, ignore the, uh, part here with, uh, ignore the part here with, uh, South Station. Uh, no, 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 with, the uh, the north south railing. Just look, look, just pretend the black stuff doesn't exist and it's just that station. Because our regional rail plan is specifically about what to do. It, it, it kind of like sets things up to make the north south railing easier to build, but it's not, it does not assume north south railing. It's, it's intended as a kind of way of making NSRL fail gracefully. If you do this and you don't build NSRL, you're still going to get pretty good regional rail in Boston. It's, it, yeah, it's going to be better with NSRL, but, but it works. But it's a good, but it's a good first step that if it, if the rest does not happen, it will still be very good. Um, at any rate, so the city, even next to the red, even it's kind of a red line express. I mean, yeah, you're going to have pretty high frequency South Station, there's the UMass, and then Quincy. Um, yeah, there could be more stops, but that's what the red line is for. And then it's going to print, and it's going to be maybe half hour every half hour. So people definitely look at schedules. Buses have to be timed, like in Markton. Um, like Plymouth, maybe Middleborough. Um, and uh, if this were a red line, like, let's pretend, for example, no, for example, this is not America, but Japan. Same land use, same everything, but let's say that they run trains of Japanese way for whatever reason. Uh, the matching of the colors, uh, north and south, is me. We have not actually, uh, it, it is me, and we have not thought about this at all in terms of matter. So, in terms of matters, um, I've actually spent a lot of time optimizing timetables uh, for, for regional rail, but all of this assumes no north-south rail link. Now, with north-south rail link, um, I've had to sketch a little bit of what might extra, what me might need to be done extra, like certain things that we believe a single track might need to be doubled, for example, on this trunk. But um, we haven't figured out things like match uh, which lines match really well. Um, or Or what the overall timetable is going to be, which is going to be probably different, uh, especially because on the north side there's just going to be a lot more uh, demand if this is opening, because um, the north side and south side in Boston have about the same, uh, they have about the same demand for commuter travel to uh, to Boston. Uh, I think, it's, we're getting the exact numbers, but I think it's a difference of maybe 10% of that. But, um, no, North Station is at the edge of city center, and South Station is at city center. The um, busiest station, actually, in the city, if you draw not a kilometer, but a half mile radius around it for a number of clubs, it's actually South Station, not even, let's say, downtown crossing here. So, um, so, so this is just a better location than this, and the result is that the South Side Line has higher model split than the North Side Line. And this is not going to be fixed by regional. Regional is going to make everything better 
to the same effect. North-south ray length, in contrast, is good for everyone, but is especially good north-side. So there's going to be different frequencies and, and um, certain compromises made on the north side on design have to be then remade with more concrete. As I keep saying, electronics before concrete, not instead of concrete. Um, so this is why we haven't done the matching. This is, again, I, I mean, I did write the matching of north-south side, like here or something else, but um, a lot of that would need to be redone anyway. That's fine. Um, and so, so anyway, the point is that even this is Japan. So let's say this is Japan. In Japan, the way they build things is uh, they run commuter trains and subway trains um, fundamentally on the same technology. They even have a lot of throw running in Tokyo, like throw running of commuter lines onto the subway, to the point that in Tokyo, out of the 13 um, subway lines of Tokyo, um, only four, uh, no, not even four, four or three. Uh, I'm confusing myself right now. No, three. Only three are not connected to some kind of commuter line at some hand. So the first two were built separate. Uh, were built as separate systems, uh, Ginza and uh, Marunouchi. Then the third, uh, uh, Masaksa, was built specifically as kind of a as a subway line with like subway stop spacing, but also as a kind of through regional rail between the uh, b between Kase and Keiko. Then uh, Hibia uh, um, is Tokitobu. Uh, Tozai is kind of weird and probably should be suffered. Uh, uh, thing from the Chuo local reverse as a Chuo local reverse branch to an extension that was built essentially as a suburban extension as a third, third sector suburban extension of Tozai. Uh, Chiyoda, it's not Tobu Tokyo, I think it's. No, it's JR East Joban to uh, I think to uh, Odakyu. Uh, Hanzumon is Tobu Tokyo. Uh, Yurakucho is either Tobu or Seibu at the uh, Ikebukuro end to nothing at the other end. Mita. Oh no, Mita is still. Uh, Mita, I think, connects to the Megro line. Uh, and then nothing at the northern end. Nambuko also Megro line to nothing at the northern end. Uh, Oedo is the one that doesn't connect or anything. It's a linear motor. Mm -hmm. And then Fukuto Shen is Tokyo. Oh, Kyoto is 100%. Okay. Yeah, so Tokyo is not 100%. Tokyo is 10 out of 13 lines are essentially regional right Um. And uh, and so in um, but but it means that if you're riding within Tokyo, you don't care where it connects to. I mean, yeah, some of the lines become express trains further, some of them are local, but you don't care. You're just you're 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 just taking trains within the city, and you look down on people who live in Chiba and Saitama in the same way that people in New York look down on people who live in Jersey, and people in Paris look down on people who live in the banlieue. Um, and so in uh, and, and so in what's called, and, and so in Boston, if it is like that, it could be that there may be that the, historically what they probably should have done was realize like this is never going to be a good mainline railway. I mean, what right? So take this red line that we've just built to Braintree and then reuse, maybe even a single track with some creative scheduling, to get the red line to Brockton and then to Plymouth and then to Middleborough. Um, and then we begin on the single track thing over to Hyena to, to Cape Cod, and then to Greenbush. And even if it's technologically a subway, operationally to the regional rail, it has to be run as a scheduled railroad, where the schedule matters more than headway management, because people look at the timetable when the train is run every half hour or whatever like that. Um, they have to make very narrow slots because this line that to Ashland would look like this. So it would be, I don't know, 10 minutes to Ashland, 10 minutes to Quincy, and then half an hour to each of these. And you have to have a lot of scheduled precision, um, but it's, it's a, um, as opposed to headway management. Uh, you have to have time connections with the buses uh, at, let's say, Brockton. Um, so that would be a regional way in conception even with subway technology, in the same way that BART is, in many ways, a regional railway using weird subway technology to the point that I once, uh, so, so for a year, 
my, my last year in grad school, um, I was a trivia night co-host. A friend of mine, and a friend and I did a trivia night at uh, uh, at, at, a, at a bar near Colombia, at, at a bar slash restaurant near Colombia, and uh, the and, and one of the questions that I asked at one point was, "What is the only American commuter rail network that is all electrified?" And the answer is that nobody caught it because a bunch of people said BART because they perceived BART as commuter rail. Uh, I think the only person who answered a real, I think only the only team that, that gave a real commuter rail network said the LIRR, which is a reasonable answer, it's the wrong one. And, um, but, and again, BART is again operationally regional rail, and Interboro is operationally a subway, and it doesn't matter what technology they're going to use on it. Um, even if they keep the freight, even if they, so, um, there's, so there's a little bit, as I said, there's a little bit of freight. Most of the line is, yeah, so the line does have four tracks, mostly. There's a narrow, as I think, around here uh, that only has room for two. Um, and uh, this narrows, they need, they need to either kick out the handful of freight trains a day or figure out a way of doing sharing. Um, which is going to be a big decision, but also, I think, a marginal one. Like, I think getting it wrong is not going to be deleterious to the project if everything else is done right. Or, 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 let me put it. There's a way to optimize getting out freight, and there's a way to optimize keeping freight, and one of them is probably going to be much better than, no, much, but one of them is likely to be better than the other, but picking the wrong one to optimize is not going to be a bad, it's not going to be especially bad, I think. And at any rate, yeah, so if you are um, in line with freight, that kind of makes you a bit regional, but not really. I mean, I mean, you're, it's a short interline, not a lot of freight. Um, dominant, it's passenger rail dominant. It's gonna have very high frequency, like passenger rail. I mean, yeah, maybe you need to know that at um, 10:30 at night, when frequency drops to every 10 minutes, there's gonna be some freight. Whatever. I mean, when I'm taking a train at 11 at night or whatever or, or anything like that, yeah, I'm used to having 10-minute wait. I mean, I'm complaining about 10-minute wait at 9 in the evening, not at 11 in the evening. Um. So the um and so this is not regional rail in the country, you know, whereas the things that we're talking about before the uh, and this by the way still needs a duty again. All of this needs to be a duty again. Park Club is very Park Club is very rich. Park Club is very desirable. Park Club is very high rent. Park Club has uh, townhouses. Now if you're British, you know what this is. so these are I think they've been chopped into apartments, a bunch of them, but a lot of them are rich enough, it's just family, family. Again, maybe some of them have been chopped that it's three families, three families, three families, three families, three families. Um, but look at this. Three and a half stories. You're on, uh, you're, you're right next to the F train. This is not a very busy train, the F train, because the F train is severely overcrowded coming from Queens. This is generally the, the, the theme in, uh, in New York is that there, there's a certain imbalance in that things that are coming from uptown Manhattan are severely overcrowded. I mean, not all in the one, isn't it? The two, three are severely overcrowded. Four or five are severely overcrowded. The AD, so the express trains, are severely overcrowded. Uh, the six is the only local that's also severely overcrowded. Uh, the stuff coming in from Queens is also, uh, for the most part, severely overcrowded. And then these same trains, let's like say the F train runs every four minutes rush hour. Why? Because it is incredibly overcrowded. There's a, I mean, they built four crossings, like four two-track crossings on the subway between Manhattan and Queens, because they built the system in the first third of the 20th century. So they built four crossings, right? Um, 40, um, 42nd Street slash the Steinway Tunnel for the 7, uh, 53rd Street Tunnel for the EM, 59, uh, 60th Street Tunnel for an uh, RW, and 63rd Street Tunnel, which is the uh, weird one, so it's kind of a half tunnel, because it's only one service and it sure starts with other things. So every four minutes, not every two, every two or two and a half, it's 63rd Street. So it's three and a half crossings. Brooklyn has 14th Street on the L, which is the only thing that gets you to here, which is why it's crowded. Then the Wellensburg Bridge, so hope to. Um, Rutgers Street Tunnel on the F, uh, Manhattan Bridge, which is four tracks, so one, two, three, four, five, 
Uh, and then the four lower Manhattan crossings. By the way, Brooklyn Bridge also used to be crossing, but not anymore. So, but then you have the four lower Manhattan crossings, which are, um, let me see if I'm going to remember the order of them, uh, is on, so it's going to be the AC, so this is called, uh, why do I not remember this? Fulton Street Tunnel, I think. Um, and then, Two three that it yeah and then two three which is called Clark Street uh, R and historically also the N like this uh, which is big far the least busy because it's actually really good access by uh, it's called Monte, uh, Montague Street Tunnel I think it's Montague on the back and then uh, four five is Jarlamon Street so one two three four five six seven eight Nine crossings versus four. Maybe eight and a half versus three and a half because issues with the R and that. So yeah, so um yeah, I think maybe more people get to Manhattan from Brooklyn to work than Queens, but by a very small margin. So critically overcrowded, underfall. The F specifically pairs with a very overcrowded thing in Queens. Well, please take this. Uh and increase the density from something that looks like this to something that looks like this, tiny. Um, so that's an example of DOD within the city. Um, DOD that is very desirable because what is desirable about Port Club? I don't think it's the townhouse. I, I, I don't think that people especially care about the architecture. They don't. They just care about having a location that is historically wealthy and gets them within a couple of stops on a train, busy but not critically so, into their own hand and Um And the same thing is true here in uh, South Brooklyn, or rather, this area was called South Brooklyn, and then uh, the area had declined, then it gentrified, and, it got, and the neighborhoods got these cute names because they wanted to distinguish themselves from the decline South Brooklyn, so they called it Cobble Hill, William Hill, Carroll Gardens. And now they're all gentrified, so they just all call themselves South Brooklyn. Unfortunately, a lot of people say South Brooklyn and mean this area, which is Southern Brooklyn, which is different, but whatever. Uh, so again, here, also on the F train, people don't especially care about uh, the land, about the charming architecture. It's not actually that charming. These buildings are really repetitive. Um, or, or and they're certainly not high quality in any way, shape, or form. Um, and turn that and land use again. Second Avenue. Second Avenue is already pre TOD. The, they actually up zoned Second Avenue in the, sec, rather, in, the 19, in 1961, where they down zoned the city, where they, they built, when they created the modern zoning code in 1961. They uh, mostly went by um, subway accessibility, um, but um, they assumed that Second Avenue subway would open soon, so they actually um, gave Second Avenue um, the highest density zoning. Um, so again, not upzoning, but failure to downzone, uh, because they thought that the Canavan subway would open very soon in uh, 1961, and I guess 55 years later, it indeed opened. Um, so yeah, do this here and here. That's urban DOD, but also suburban DOD is really important, because you want to make sure these trains are not just non draper taking the train 9 to 5 to work. And this means um, if Betty Draper comes into the meeting and Karen's um, her way into complaining about the coals, I mean, better people can replace the Drapers. Um, so, but again, as I said, it's politically a fight. It's politically a fight much more so when you are not at the station. Um, it, it's much more of a fight when you're trying to build bike lanes through the station just because it's not as preemptible, or maybe not as easy to preempt, um, just to make sure that people have things to take the train from, and of course, too, of course, you want to create more jobs in New York City, which thankfully, like, I mean, the city is good at creating its own jobs. I mean, the problem is they don't build enough office towers, and then they rejected the Amazon uh, plan because it didn't bribe the local politicians enough, but the, um, uh, the um, but creating more jobs here in Long Island City, um, creating more jobs in of course, um, Manhattan, yeah, literally, literally everywhere. Manhattan, South of 59th, really would be that. Um, that's also 
think people can take the train too. But as I said, I mean, New York currently has, actually has, especially on the Long Island side of it, not very high levels of pubs. Probably it's, a lot of it is more making sure that people can reside in these areas which build very little housing um, and take the train to okay. Long Island City and most of all, Manhattan. Uh, so partly, again, it's a part of the original is, is really doing this kind of system where things about electrification and high platforms, high frequency, integrated frequency really with other things, integrated fares, um, uh, making sure the trains don't randomly derate their acceleration for bullshit reasons. Um, as, as a kind of an interface thing about making the train uh, usable. And then there's some kind of interface about, let's say, bike lanes and walkability so, uh, to deal with the last mile or the last two miles. And then the, and then there's the TOD to make sure to, that all of this can actually serve actual ridership as opposed to, I mean, yeah, I mean, sure, I'm sure you can take the train to random S-Bahn stop is that only that has like a forest which I can take the train to once as a kind of urban exploration and then never again. Um, so so that, that's kind of like the main component. As I said, I'm not going to talk about crayon. I mean, I've not, I mean, not I mean, it's been more than three hours, more than three and a half hours. I have not talked about crayon very much. I mean, I use the crayon as an illustrative example, but but it's really about system wide things that, as I said, organize, like electronic is working great. So you've got the organization of electronics, right? Um, but it's to say better like use of data analytics for planning, which means, for example, understanding that people actually want to live here, and it's not because they um, are wedded to you know 1950s architecture or whatever. It's just they like the location and that it's close to New York City jobs, so build more housing there. Frankly, um, which means understanding modern timetabling, um, better electrical systems, better signaling, and so on. Um, and uh, when you do that right, it's getting it, not electronics instead of concrete, electronics before concrete. Once you do that, you're creating a lot of demand. It makes it just much easier to do all this crayon, this is Boston crayon, but rather than New York crayon, because suddenly you, it becomes less, less, less speculative. But wait, are people going to use all these ones? Of course they are when, I mean, when you're offering them really, really good service. And, uh, and, you, and you're aware that a lot of people do the last mile connection on the subway um, at the city end, and you know that a lot of people are complaining that the train gets them not quite to Manhattan, let's say the, on the south side, if everything were right. Because again, the line exists from here, which is Flatbush Avenue to Point East. There's one more branch that I have not included because I think that if this is specifically the crown that's going to get built, so six lines um, where only one tunnel has hogged the entire south side, then doing this is another, like keeping the West Hampstead branch is through branch might actually overload. Um, not sure, but I think it might. I think you need double service on the Babylon branch here. And so, um, and if you do that, then, yeah, I mean, I mean it, it, so if you do this bit and much better service, much better connections to Flatbush have, yeah, people are going to complain that they're going to take the train to Manhattan or something, and people are going to, um, and, and, but you're going to see a lot of ridership for people who work in Brooklyn, for people who work in Jamaica. Um, you're you're going to see a lot of short ridership, though, that's short of the city. You're going to see a bunch of reverse big ridership. Um Again, not as much as in places with a lot of drop sprawl, but you'd be some. You'd see beach ridership, people uh, taking the train for beaches and for long beaches, as opposed to just the rockaways. Um, and you, you'll see all this, and then yeah, it makes it very attractive to build this grant, to build this Lower Manhattan system. So, frip and frip and frip. Uh, and so, and yeah, that's one way of doing the crayon. There are millions of ways of doing the crayon. I mean, again, I think this may be better than certain other plans, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you need to get everything else right on the way to doing, to, to debating whether you're going to build this way or this way or this way or whatever. That's kind of the main insight of regional rail. Um, so, you have, and this is, and this is really what New York City needs because people talk too much about crayon. They talk about, oh, let's shove more trains into Manhattan. Let's shove more um, human mass into a train using bi-level trains that are really uncomfortable and um, and fail completely when the seats are all full, but at least 
nobody's going to have to stand in a vestibule for one more year or something. Um, so, it's a, so it's a kind of more modern way of kind of understanding how to make regional rail more like the subway. It can be, again, it can't be expected as a subway because the branching structure means that you need to schedule it very differently. Um, but conceptually, otherwise, so think of it as part of a regional rail system as opposed to, as part of an integrated rail system as opposed to the mentality that commuter rail is on mass transit, uh, courtesy of uh, former MBTA general manager, Frank Tapala. Um, so essentially, this is how it's going to work, and um, I think I'm going to stop here, and because it's been because I thought it was going to be a two-hour stream, and uh, not two hours, uh, sorry, not two hours. And so uh, I will take questions if anyone has any. Actually, more than this because the recording numbers, like the recording length here, uh, is always a couple of minutes before I so I started around six seventeen ish. And it is 3.30, but it says 3.27. Um, and, they, and on YouTube, you see the real numbers. Um, so are there questions? Is the main question. Would New York benefit? LDN means London, right? Okay, so first of all, Bernard, I may have talked to you about this, maybe on a previous stream, maybe on Twitter, or maybe on comment, blog comments, but for everyone else's benefit. Um, Line Identity is a blog post that I have been procrastinating writing for at least a year, which is related to, because it's a tie into another blog post that's been in development hell about the, the Japanese way of building subways. So it's actually a blog post here, things like um, American, so it started with the American way of building rapid transit. On um, like making a kind of argument that there's like there are commonalities in American cities kind of learning from each other, and these are not by the way necessarily bad things. It's like a lot of it is early 20th century stuff. So. Um, and then British, uh, Soviet, uh, French, and German, and they want to do Japanese. And uh, one of the things there is that in um, Japan, a very strong line identity. Uh, also in Korea, which is in, which. I mean, if you just look at the subway maps of the various countries and the maybe the high-speed rail maps, you would conclude that South Korea either was part of um, the state of Japan or had very recently been part of the state of Japan, which is in fact correct. Uh, South Korea was in a Japanese colony for a while, and then after it wasn't, it remained kind of an economic colony for, for a generation, in the same way that like, they bunch of uh, French colonies uh, that decolonized became, remained economically dependent on France. So actually, there's a lot of uh, French engineering work being done in the Maghreb, especially. So you can kind of see the French way of building rapid transit in Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, to the point that the uh, high-speed trains in Morocco are essentially TGVs. And they don't just mean technology, like everything about them is TGVs. So there's something called line identity, which is um, a bunch of different things. Um, and in the Japanese way, um, yeah, let's do it this way. Um, I think it's the best way of showing it in uh, on the timeline. You could see the same thing in Seoul. It's just going to be more interesting. So um, let's center it a little bit to the left, right, because my uh, head is going to be... Okay, so my head is around here. Okay, so this is Tokyo as it is today. Um, so this is, and this is a rapid transit map, so it is tech, so um, it doesn't care if it's regional rail or subway, so all of these are, these are early regional rail lines, and it doesn't even care about electrification, so in London it goes back to the 1830s, it cares about uh, 
having an urban enough stomp spacing and enough frequency, I think the standard is 20 minutes of peak, every 20 minutes of peak. Um, so we're starting to see the development of the commuter rail network, which is not where the line identity is. So some of these lines are JR, like this is the Yamanote, this is the Chuo, this is the Tokaido, but some of these are already private. Uh, so this is uh, KQ. The red thing here is KQ. Uh, this is Tokyo. Uh, and, uh, and now in 1930, we're starting seeing the subway from 1927. This is the orange line. And we see again more of these lines built, more commuter lines. Um, but pay attention to the subway. So, the, so this is the Ginza line. Uh, and it was built again in 1920s, 30s. Uh, and yeah, this is the end. And uh, it has not been extended then. Now, it does connect various rail terminals, but this was before they figured out the through running system. So um, if they had been building the Ginza line based on modern understanding, they probably would have connected, used it to connect the Saksa terminal of uh, Tobu with, uh, I don't know, maybe the, maybe the what is it called, you know, the um, Inoshita line, um, or maybe with one of these uh, Tokyo lines. Uh, now, the, and here's the socket line, still both standard gauge separately from everything, so if they'd built it based on modern understanding, they would figure out how to use it to extend either to, um, either Tobu or Seibu. Here's how you remember which uh, which one is Tobu and which one is Seibu, if you don't know Tokyo that well. Uh, at Ikebukuro, Tobu, you can kind of see, is a little bit west of the station, and Seibu is a little bit east, which is exactly the opposite of what To and Sei mean in uh, Sino Japanese. So again, second line is completed for the most part. Yeah, there's a tail, but mostly completed. And then they build the third line, which is a Saksa, already based on the modern system of connecting Keisei to, uh, it's going to be Keikyu here. Uh, then Hibia. Uh, th um, and now they're already starting to do Tozai. Then, okay, so now we're completing Tozai, and then she, and, and then uh, uh, they build Chiyoda and Mita uh, at the same time. Uh, so the, I think Chiyoda, I guess, happens first, maybe. A, so, so one of the things I'm trying to show here is that it's not like, okay, maybe 50 years later they will do some extension on the Marunouchi line, or one of the old lines, like Marunouchi or Ginza. Like they build a line, they complete the line, then they move on to the next line. And so it's the same thing. Um, and Paris doesn't do that. In in Paris, it's so and, and so and again, same thing here. Okay, and now uh, these lines: the uh, uh, Chioda, Mita, uh, uh, Yurakucho, and then Shinjuku, and then starting Hanzomon, uh, then Nambuku, then uh, Oedo, and then um, oh, which opens as a single thing, essentially, and then uh, Fukutoshin, and. Uh, the opposite way of doing it is uh, Paris. Uh, um, so, again, this is kind of in the same way that we with Tokyo because it, um, because Alexander's not just doing um, subways, but also other frequent things. Um, so you're, okay, so maybe you can, in 1900, only one metro line open, but 1905, you have one, two, three. This is part of uh, current six. By 1910, they have one, two, this is six, and this is five, but at the time, this part is interlined with five and not six. Uh, four, which took a little while longer to open because the tunnel under the sun was difficult because they needed to figure out how to do underwater tunneling. Uh, this is 12, which is a different uh, company at the time, and then parts of seven. So they build the early lines, then uh, 7, 8, uh, this is 13 again from the company that did 12. And you can kind of see, so let's say in the 1930s, up in the 1930s, and then they start expanding these lines. So they built a bunch of lines in the city in the first 30 years, and then, and, and in this system, they already have every existing, the trunk of every existing numbered line from 1 to 10, plus 12. Um, uh, this is 11. Uh, 13 would only 
uh, be extended uh, here in the 1970s, and 14 is 1990s. Deposits. And now they're doing the suburban extensions kind of simultaneously. So that's so it's part of the way. It's kind of like the order of how you're going to build. Um, and if it's something that looks very suburban, it's because it's RER, and let's not talk about it for a moment. Um, so you can kind of see there's more creation of suburban things, like here, or here, or here, or here. Um, and then 13, uh, you have the, can you have the 13 trunk, and then single trunk. And um, so that's part of line identity. So, um, so do you build a system as a system, or as the lines? And in Tokyo and Seoul is more lines, and in Paris is very system. That's one thing. The other thing, and this is where Paris is very like Tokyo and Seoul, is um, are lines managed separately? And the answer is yes, in Paris. Um, each line has its own set of drivers and its own set of rolling stock. And in Tokyo, it's even more extreme because in Tokyo, because they have different track ages, different lines can have different track ages. Um, so, um, but even in Paris, where um, they don't, the lines form two classes, each of which is uh, internally uh, internally compatible because um, some lines are uh, rubber tires, some are, uh, or what were converted to rubber tires, some of them are original steel tires, and other steel tires are steel wheels. Um, but, um, and yeah, maybe, you know, every 20 years, maybe they buy new trains for one line and then they cascade the rolling stock to a different line, but it's not the same as shared equipment pools or shared driver pools. So I can tell you how many drivers there are on a specific line. Actually, I don't know how many train drivers there are in the Paris Metro in general, but I could find you at one point the number of drivers on, I believe, line 13. They talked about it because it's kept, they're managed separately. Um, so that's a very strong line identity. And um, London has that to some extent, um, especially on the tube system, not on the subsurface system. New York and Berlin both have very weak line identities uh, to the point that the, so in Berlin, as in Paris and as an aircraft to standards of equipment, um, but it's all about rubber tires versus steel wheels. It's a uh, uh, different sizes of trains. Uh, so in New York, it's called A division or IRT or numbered lines and uh, B division or BMT slash IND or, or letter lines. Um, and here it's called Klein Profil and Gross Profil. Again, smaller and bigger trains, except that our bigger trains are, I think, smaller than the smaller trains in New York. And, um, but for example, the uh, Gross Profil, uh, it's lines U5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And, um, these trains, because they're, I guess, they're, they're a common equipment pool to all these lines, they have non-electronic maps, uh, like they have sticker maps of the lines. So one car, so in a car you will have, uh, so not the green lines, which are S-Bahn. S-Bahn essentially never has line identity. Um, and, uh, I mean, Tokyo is a, it's unique because it's essentially a subway, and Paris is kind of unique, but in, but in Berlin, for example, there's, there's no strong line identity for the s bound lines, um, or, or even different trunks. And uh, so here, so this is U5, this is U6. Wait, wait, let me center so that my head doesn't cover him. U5, U6, U7, uh, U8, U9. Um, and there's some track connections between them. And the same equipment pole will have stickers with the line maps of all five because maybe today my train runs on U8, but maybe tomorrow the same physical train runs on U7. Um, and often it also means moving things between lines. I mean, Paris is, I mean, Tokyo I don't think has ever done it. Paris has done it to some, um, to some extent. Uh, New York does it all the time. Berlin also kind of does it. So this is what I mean by line identity. Uh, yes, yeah, so New York is, a, so the court, yeah, yeah, New York, uh, yeah, the court, exactly. New York has, Differences between the root and the line, which indicates weak line identity because the physical infrastructure is the culture line, but the service is the F, which runs on the culture line, and then on uh, 6th Avenue Local, and then 63rd Street Tunnel, and then Queens Boulevard Express, and these could be and were in living memory swapped, and some people keep talking about swapping them, and I don't just mean crayonistas. Uh, so as an example, in New York, um, uh, I was talking before about the Williamsburg Bridge, and the N, and not N, the M. So the way it works now is the M 
runs the BMT line through um, Brooklyn, and then it goes on the Williamsburg Bridge, and then, so it used to go uh, like this, down to Broad Street, and then at rush hour, it would then be extended um, through this tunnel to, I'm forgetting where, not all the way to Bay Ridge, but I think somewhere here, maybe, um, but running local on 4th Ave. And they decided, as a way of decongesting the L, which was um, already 20 years ago, incredibly overcrowded, they decided, wait, we have the M, which is roughly close, but people don't really ride the Jamzad. This is the Jamzad trains. Uh, they don't really ride them because they only get to lower Manhattan, so let's try to get to Midtown, the bigger job center. So they used an existing track connection, which goes from here to here. Um, you see the little corner? Uh, that uh, and they converted the M from an orange line through uh, 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 going underneath Nassau Street to a uh, sorry, sorry from a brown line going underneath Nassau Street with the Jan Zab to the to to a Sixth Avenue local, um, merging it in the process with a different train that ran here local called the V. It went like this and then terminated here. So they kind of interlined these two things um, and called them the and, and called the resulting service the M. Uh, and uh, uh, and I don't think this had the help for Antac. Like the uh, like it didn't decongest the L or didn't decongest it very, or didn't decongest it by enough. Um, I guess the gentrifiers mostly live here and not here. But um, the uh, but at any rate, the um, so so lines get moved. So services get moved between physical lines. Whereas in in Berlin, we don't have these line names that are fixed with. I mean, we just say on U8. Um, and this is even though we have weaker, relatively weak line identity, and in Paris, even more so, people don't say, oh, on the uh, Champs-Élysées line. No, they just say M1. Uh, and so, so this is an example. So in New York, the fact you have separate identities uh, for, for the physical and protocol services is an indicator of weak line identity. Now, at any rate, I, I bring all of this up uh, because... Um, would New York benefit from these line identities? The answer is yes, but this is a separate question on the subway regarding uh, de-interlining. On regional rail, I believe New York will eventually develop this kind of line identity if the crayon that I'm proposing is built. Now, I'm saying the crayon that I'm proposing. Why? Because there's... Um, so again, I'm going to show people the crayon just as a kind of anchoring thing, um, and because it's not something that's very easy to like show you phases or something. So... The red line, line one, is existing tunnel. And it's, yeah, you can do it through running there. And then line two, the green line, is supposed to be a gateway to Grand Central. Uh, this was studied as part of ARC, rejected for rather bullshit reasons of agency turf battles. I mean, they didn't say that, but it emerges from the dog if you read between the lines. And you can't read the whole things because in the United States, it's not like in the Nordic countries. In the Nordic countries, you want information, it's already there. In New York, you need to, in New York, in the United States, or in Britain, you need to file a freedom of information request, and it might get denied, or they might say they lost it, or they might say they need to redact the document because reasons, or they might just say yes, 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 and this, and then uh, uh, do the, the same thing that Pretty Patel does to immigrants. I don't mean the part with an S, I mean the part where it's uh, uh, saying yes, 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 come tomorrow, come tomorrow, come tomorrow, come tomorrow. Oh, you're so discouraged, and you went back to Jamaica. Yes. Uh, so, so, so essentially, it's, it's kind of hostile environment uh, form of governance. And so, uh, but what emerges in the lines was a bunch of agency turf. But again, I mean, they're planning this project, right? not this part, but this part is not hard. I mean, it's expensive. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a two kilometer tunnel through midtown Manhattan. It's not going to be cheap. But when it's expensive, I mean, several hundred millions of dollars. I don't mean several billions. Um, and, uh, which, again, something that I think is possible. Um, this, also. Now, this I don't think creates much line identity because it's not enough lines on a lot of branches. I think that if these are built, so the kind of more RE, RE things with with a bunch of lines within uh, within the city uh, on a trunk. Um, so this is a little bit of line three, actually, which has a long trunk, um, to the point that it doesn't have enough branches, I don't think. Um, a problem. Certainly lines... What I call line four, so blue and line five, a yellow. These are things with a lot of stops on the trunk that are urban and dense. Um, and I think it has happened it, because it kind of cements a kind of service. And when it, yes, it, it kind of says, yeah, forever for the remainder of the 21st century, 
on Southside LIRR lines, in addition to go over things that are, they might have phrases that are being Southside LIRR lines, uh, are going to go through Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan to the Erie main lines. And if you want to go to Midtown, you're going to have this cross platform transfer. Um, yeah, maybe it's, or, or, or if you want, there might be a cross platform transfer um, at Jamaica to, uh, um, to either line three or line six, or possibly both if you do the through train. If you keep the three train thing, where you have three trains uh, on uh, in the same direction on two platform uh, on with two platforms between them, uh, and then you can walk through the middle train, and they keep the doors open for like a minute, and you can walk through the middle train. Um, it's something that LIR does, and I think it should be doing it more systematically um, and with clock face timetabling. Um, and yeah, so this I think is going to create line identity, and this is a Good thing. It actually simplifies the system because it's ungodly difficult to plan something like this. I mean, Boston's easy mode, okay? Boston is something that I put together most of the timetables in 2017, 2018, no, not 2017, 2018. And then since then I was taking questions. All of them were essentially in effect. Um, uh, and yeah, maybe I need to adjust it by a minute. I mean, I mean it, was, it was always enough that it didn't destroy the entire concept. New York is hard though. New York, can I do it? Yeah. As a full-time job for you know, six months, um, and um, and in Boston it was very much not a full-time job, and very much was not six months. Uh, and so, if you can, so, so, so the point of having a bunch of different lines can be managed separately is that it simplifies the system. If it simplifies the system, it means that you can do planning on the timetabling on let's say this line four, so that's the blue one, um, and it's never going to check track with anything other than things that are colored blue. Um, the only intercolor track sharing in this map, this ground is uh, red green here. Maybe possibly green orange here, but this is a four track line, so in theory you don't need to do that. I mean, in practice, it might be good for some kind of local express service, but you probably should not do that. Um, at any rate, so it means that uh, it means that where, it means that you don't need to worry about cascading failures. You have this line if you do the crayon. I mean, so if you don't do the crayon. Uh, you might still be able to separate lines for the most part and not have them be interdependent, um, which is difficult in New York with how the terminals are set up. It's easier in Boston. Boston has more space. New York doesn't have enough, and this is where the running would help. But I mean, it would still have branches that are kind of part of the same line. So something like line four here is probably the most R E R E in the sense of just long trunk in the city and then it branches into something in the suburbs or in Staten Island, which is socially the suburbs. Uh, and uh, so when when this happens, um, yes, I mean, for example, we have, it's not like you have zero interface with other lines. Like the idea is that, for example, here there should be a cross platform transfer between the what I call line five and what I call line four. Um, but it's not. But it doesn't have to be timed. Why? Remember how at the beginning I was talking about how uh, at the beginning an hour and a half ago I was talking about how different the lines with different frequency would interline here. Well, yeah, it means that on the trunks they're going to have a train every two and a half minutes. Uh, let me just point out something that when you have two when you have two subway lines or two whatever lines or regional lines running every two and a half minutes and you have a cross platform transfer, nobody in the right mind would time it, right? I mean, it's two and a half minutes if it's timed if it's timed pessimally. It's not going to be timed pessimally, but and, and at that point you don't even want to worry about optimal timing because two and a half minutes. Is close enough to the limit of a line, right? I mean, the limit of a line is in theory two minutes. So the way it works in Eric is they think the limit is two minutes, and then with um, uh, because it needs spare capacity to make the line work, because everything, if you don't have spare capacity, the line will never work in practice. Um, so they think that the, that the theoretical is two and the practical is the first. In reality, the theoretical is like one and a half and the practical is like two. But um, I mean, not one and a half, but like one point something and one point seven or something. Then practical is two. But when you're two and a half, um, the, the thing is that um, you don't want to hold trains for let's say a minute for a connecting train. Essentially, no system can ever expect there not to be one minute delays. So you should be resilient to thirty second delays, one minute delays, especially when you're connecting to regional rail. And this is also why regional rail doesn't necessarily have the same throughput as a captive metro where you don't need to be resilient to 60 second delays, only 20 or 30 second ones. And um, and so the um, 
And so, whole, uh, and so a transfer timing introduces more dependency in regards to be resilient to, let's say, one minute delay, 90 second delay, which is normally fine. But when you're running every two and a half minutes, that might lead to cascading failure. So instead, you don't time the transfer. It's okay. It's two and a half minutes. Nobody is going to be, I mean, people might be slightly bombed at having just missed the trains and have to connect to the next one. But you know something? Um, it's two and a half minutes. Who cares? Um, if it's suburb to suburb, they might care more, but the main use case is not going to be connection to suburb to suburb. It's not going to be like someone who only wants to go between, I don't know, Babylon or somewhere on that line and then has to go to specifically a brand, like, like maybe a tail of uh, the Harlem line that doesn't run that frequently. I mean, that's very, un this is a very unusual use case. Like the main use cases that are not just people traveling on a single line to a city center job is people connecting to a different line to a near center job. So something like from somewhere on the south side of Long Island to let's say Harlem, or Midtown would be a big one. Uh, somewhere in Harlem, maybe White Plains, um, or, 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 uh, or, I don't know, Patterson, I don't know, Patterson to something. So, so the point is that the line identity, which I think follows from just building the infrastructure, um, it's not very much a matter of what kind of service you're running, if that makes sense. Um, and, and, and I know it's a very, it's been a very long answer, and I'm kind of curious if, uh, you have more questions, or if you think I've answered your question, um, or, or if you have follow-up questions about this, I, either way. We'll try to end this at four hours, but this is a fake four hours. It's actually been 355, not 352. So again, I'm going to give people a few minutes to like type and things, but if not, then I'm probably going to end this. Oh, oh, awesome! Yeah, glad I did, Barnes. Um, all right, so anyway, are there other questions? I guess my computer is already, I mean, you'll see this, and you'll hear, I mean, I mean, I imagine you're hearing this on Twitch also, um, that you're hearing the fan, because my computer has been videoing for so long that it uh, has issues with heating. Like, it, it's so hot, so, so, the, so the fan is so hot, let's say, um, the left side, I think, here. Um, that um, I it's something I had to learn that um, if I so as you're very well aware, if you've been watching or if you've been reading me uh, on Twitter, um, I, approximately three hundred percent of my food consumption is chocolate. And as a result, I sometimes, or occasionally, if I put in chocolate uh, adjacent to my computer on the left, and the computer, and uh, then the heat exhaust that I just showed you on the video um, can plausibly melt the chocolate. It can plausibly melt the chocolate uh, because of how the, uh, um, because of the heat. So I learned, for example, Put chocolate far away from the computer, put chocolate from the right. Um, so it's kind of my computer telling me, let's stop this. So I'm going to give 
We're going to do one last round of questions and try to end this at what I think is going to be exact for hours based on a read on a number that is I well that, that I know is incorrect. So I think it's not the drop term because it's not we're not 19.2% off law. All right, if there aren't any questions, then thank you for sticking around for a for an unusually long stream. And hopefully New York will actually improve its regional rail. Even things like this, which are again not on the expensive part, the expensive part is the urban tunnels. This is the cheap this is the so this is the organizational part, so understanding things about better frequency, better accessibility, which again, is hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, you're spending tens of billions on gateway. Um, electrification of the four remaining tails. Um, not derating the electric trains anymore, but that's essentially free. Uh, um, I think maybe uh, installing um, gap fillers on all trains is a chore, but definitely you should get them on new trains. Um, and uh, then doing things like at least some kind of like at station TOD, even if doing things like bike lanes. Uh, so bike parking in TOD is what they can do more easily. Um, bike lanes is the hard part. Um, or sprawler there in communities that do not want it. takes time to like disempower a, a, a local community that's not very recognized. Um, so thank you for watching and I will see you again. Uh, for in, in, not next week because next week is MIT mystery hunt, but see you again in two weeks for another video. Ciao, ciao.